Chief, are you uh, recording to the computer or to the uh, hard drive? I'm currently recording on a separate flashcard. 10 4, would you like us to record to the computer as well or leave it? Uh, please have somebody to record as a computer as a second backup. 10 4, I'll be on that. Uh, Sergeant Hope, if you can just shut your cloud off for a moment, please. Good to go. I think you have to stop it entirely. All right, you're good now, uh, Sergeant Hope. You can put it back on. Thank you. Chairs and sergeants, we are live and ready to begin. Thank you. Sergeant Hanna, are you ready with your opening statement? Ready. Okay, good morning. I ask that you please turn your devices to vibrate. Please mute your microphones on Zoom. Please ensure that you have named yourself correctly in Zoom, or you may be either renamed by the Zoom host or removed from the hearing. We will begin the meeting of the Committee on Finance. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin when you are. Thank you very much. Good morning and welcome to the City Council's sixth and final day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2021. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on Immigration, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Menchaca, and the Public Advocate, Jamani Williams. We are also joined by the following Council Members. Council Members, um, Adams, uh, Minority Leader Mario, and um, Council Member Gredenchik. I'm sure others will be coming throughout the day. I'm going to turn it over to our committee council to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair. My name is Stephanie Ruiz and I'm counsel to the New York City's Council's Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you're recognized to speak, at which time you'll be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you've been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. I'm now handing back over to Chair Drum. Thank you again. The effects of the COVID-19 on American life and society are widespread and deeply felt. However, for undocumented immigrants across the nation, especially in New York City, the COVID-19 pandemic compounds issues that have existed for years, exposing the inequities faced by immigrant communities. From access to health care to food assistance, the city must ensure that it provides the necessary resources and information to these communities across the city. Recent data has shown that low-income city neighborhoods where many immigrants live have the most confirmed cases of COVID-19, especially in Queens, the Bronx, and Brooklyn. I am particularly concerned with this as I represent District 25 in Queens, covering parts of Jackson Heights, Corona, and Elmhurst, which is among the several communities hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. With many immigrants working in frontline industries, putting themselves and their families at risk every day, the city must ensure that there aren't any barriers or misinformation keeping immigrants from accessing the healthcare services they need during these incredibly challenging times. Food assistance is another area of concern among the city's immigrant communities. With few exceptions, undocumented immigrants are typically not eligible for federal public benefit programs. This includes the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Also, because of eligibility restrictions, the few individuals who may be eligible for benefits, such as SNAP, may also be subject to a public charge determination, which may affect their immigration status. This has made both documented and undocumented immigrants hesitant to take any government assistance to buy nutritional items like infant formula, 
fearing that the government could deny their green card application. And if they take any federal aid, they could risk their, their move towards citizenship. I hope to learn more today about how the administration is addressing the issue. Immigrants from across the world come to New York City seeking sanctuary and a better life. More than three million immigrants live in this city, comprising about one third of the city's population and one fourth of its workforce. They help build the city's economy, bring neighborhoods to life, and make our culture the most diverse in the country. Now more than ever, we must stand united to ensure every New Yorker, regardless of their immigration status, can access the essential services they need to keep their families safe and secure. And with that, I'm going to now turn it over to Council Member Menchaca for his opening statement. Thank you, Chair Drum, for your uh, just beautiful testimony to the work that is ahead of us. And thank you for, uh, I think this is one of the last uh, days of the budget hearings and thank you for your incredible tenacity. Um, buenos dias, everyone. I'm Carlos Menchaca, Chair of the Immigration Committee. So much is at stake in this next year's city budget. This budget is one of the most consequential in our lifetimes. It will reveal more than any other the true depth of our convictions, what we as a city council are willing to sacrifice, and for whom. Today, half of all the essential workers, the workers that we are all thanking at 7 p.m. with cheers, are immigrants. These are our neighbors who are caring for the sick, cleaning the subways, and keeping everyone fed. Yet immigrant New Yorkers and their families have largely been excluded, as you just heard from Chair Drum, from federal, state, and city relief programs so far. Worse still, immigration enforcement has ramped up during the pandemic. It has ignored with cruel ind indifference the extreme vulnerability of people in detention, putting ICE agents, public defenders, and New Yorkers at greater risk of infection. This is shameful and unacceptable. We must take bold action against these injustices by guaranteeing food, language access, healthcare, and due process. That means lawyers for everyone who cannot afford it, all while battling COVID-19. As a member of the negotiation of the council's budget negotiation team, I appreciate the competing priorities we face during an unprecedented health and economic crisis. I believe that immigrants are not a special interest. If we do not secure the well-being of over 3 million New Yorkers, there is no recovery. Unfortunately, Commissioner Mustafi, the mayor's proposed budget does not yet reflect that truth. And I look forward to talking with you about that today. And I know that you believe, as I do, that a full recovery depends on the well-being of our immigrant communities. That praise for essential workers is hollow if we exclude them and so many of their children from relief. Before we start, Commissioner Mustafi, I wanna thank Chair Drum for his extraordinary leadership, that tenacity uh, throughout this executive budget hearing and for always fighting, always fighting and putting and uplifting the voices of immigrants. Uh, I also wanna thank the staff who's prepared this hearing, uh, Finance Council, Rebecca Chasson, uh, Stephanie Rees, uh, Noah Brick, the unit head, Krillian Francisco, uh, Finance Analyst, Florentine Kabor, Committee uh, Council, Harbani Auja, Committee policy analyst, Elizabeth Kronk, and my chief of staff, Lorena Lucero, and uh, my legislative director, Cesar Vargas, and communications director, Anthony Chirito. I'll pass it over to you, Chair Drum. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I was mistaken in the opening to say that public advocate Jamani Williams was with us. I'm sure at some point today he will be, but for right now, we're going to move toward uh, the council, uh, the committee council to administer the affirmation, please. I will now call on the members of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to testify. We will hear testimony from Commissioner Bida Mustafi. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful, the best for your knowledge, information, and belief, Commissioner? I do. Thank you. You may begin when ready. 
Thank you. Um, thank you to Chair Drum, Chairman Shaka, uh, and members of the Committee on Finance and Immigration. Um, my name is Bita Mustofi. I'm the Commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Uh, my testimony today provides a quick overview of the challenges immigrant communities face at this moment and in this crisis. Um, how our office is aimed to respond to the moment and our priorities as we look towards recovery for our city together. Um, I understand the need to keep my testimony brief, so I would point you to a longer testimony that we have submitted that speaks to highlights um, of our office's work, commitments and priorities in the last year, including achievements and moving forward, as well as ways our programs have pivoted at this time. Um, now moving on, uh, I, I really think we cannot talk about uh, this crisis without acknowledging both the xenophobic and racist ways it has um, impacted our communities. By all measures, the pandemic has disproportionately impacted immigrants and people of color, Black and Latinx, communi Black and Latinx communities have been targets, anti-Asian, racism, and xenophobia as well. Many immigrant workers have been excluded from federal relief as articulated by the chairs, even though they're disproportionately represented amongst our essential workers and displaced workers. Coronavirus affects all of us. We cannot pick and choose who among our community should receive relief based on immigration status when this crisis affects all of us. Um, we have long understood as a city that our personal health and well being are connected to our collective strength. Over the last two months, Moya has worked, focused our work to respond to the needs of our communities in crises. During a crisis, language access is literally a matter of life and death. We've been working across the administration to ensure both creation and dissemination of information across multiple languages. We've led the Emergency Management Language Access Task Force, uh, and we have worked to address both needs, challenges, and coordination of these resources. We have seen a huge rise both in the commitment to and the demand for language access support across our agencies. To get critical and linguistically accessible information to our communities, we've published an online resource guide for immigrant New Yorkers. Information about how to access healthcare benefits, food resources, and more. We have spent time receiving feedback and, uh, and compiling common questions to produce a frequently asked questions questions about the benefits eligibility uh, and other application processes and so forth that we've received. That will be available early next week. While face-to-face -face engagement is not advisable, we do continue to reach immigrant communities digitally. We now offer digital and telephonic Know Your Rights trainings. We, we speak NYC classes, and we have held or participated in over do in dozens and dozens of virtual events. Our outreach and organizing team alone has participated in 47 virtual events between April 14th and May 14th. We've simultaneously prioritized communications with community and ethnic media and worked alongside sister agencies with broader media strategies to advance equity in our engagement. In addition, we've seen an exponential increase in calls and emails to our community services team. In April alone, the, receipt, the team received hundreds and hundreds of calls from community members. The majority expressed concern around food insecurity, financial assistance, and burial assistance. Finally, a priority for our team has been to provide equitable access to critical services and needs identified by, for immigrant New Yorkers, regardless of status, English proficiency, or ability to pay. I won't the labor health access because this has been a commitment of ours for some time with our guaranteed health care plan and the launch of NYC care and so so critical at this moment but I will say with many businesses closing and workers losing their job food insecurity has risen across the five boroughs the cities provided 25 million to pantries and community pantries across the city through partnership with the city council and the administration to fill gaps in accessibility. Additionally, uh, three meals a day are provided to New Yorkers regardless of status at more than 400 meal hubs citywide and delivering pre-made meals to those who cannot pick up food themselves. Moya has supported these initiatives with targeted outreach, language assistance, and sharing community feedback and more. 
Overcrowded housing is one of the most salient public health issues among immigrants in New York City. As many as 22% of New York City's immigrants reside in overcrowded households. The prevalence of overcrowded housing is particularly high around undoc for undocumented immigrants. In order to address these concerns, the city launched a temporary hotel accommodation program. It provides free hotel stays, as well as transportation, food, and wellness checks to New Yorkers who cannot isolate in their homes safely. This is available to all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status. Moya has both supported and advocated for the need for this initiative, and additionally has collaborated with Health and Hospitals, the Department of Health, and emergency management partners to ensure that New York City's immigrants in high-risk communities are both aware of these resources and feel comfortable accessing them. For many families and for loved ones of those who have, who have died or passed away or experienced loss, the cost of burials can be prohibitively expensive. HRA released an emergency rule to increase the burial assistance grant amount to increase the cap for burial assistance and to remove immigration status as a restriction. We worked with the Human Resources Administration to expand access to this grant. We also are assisting in the rollout of this program, lending our expertise to ensure accessibility and privacy protections. I want to thank the council for your support in this effort. Finally, uh, Moya worked early to better understand the economic impact and devastation that would be acutely felt by immigrant workers and mixed status homes left out of federal relief, despite their tax filings and contributions. In pri prioritizing this need with the Mayor's Fund to advance New York City, we've established the New York City COVID Immigrant Emergency Relief Program, a partnership between the Mayor's Fund and the Open Society Foundation. The fund will provide emergency cash release to up to 20,000 immigrant workers and their families. And we're working with over 30 organizations, community-based organizations across the city to help distribute the funds. This is a limited fund. It will not address the full scope of the need. And we estimate that there are well over 100,000 undocumented workers and mixed status homes who would, would not qualify for federal relief. However, we hope that this is a start to learn and build upon. The COVID-19 crisis has served to remind us that immigrants are the backbone of our city and must be intentionally integrated into a recovery plan. Immigrant workers are at the forefront of the fight against COVID-19. Our small business owners are deeply impacted. And in fact, we know immigrants own half of New York's small businesses. We continue to exist in a toxic anti-immigrant political climate. The Supreme Court's pending decision on DACA looms over our dreamers. We continue to fight back against the public charge rule and we support the effort to ensure that communities are counted in the 2020 census while pushing back against ICE's overbroad agenda. As COVID-19 cases slow down and the possibility of reopening increasing, increasingly becomes a reality, we believe that our reopening and recovery must recognize and address the economic injustices at the root of these racialized disparities. We must ensure health care and worker protections. We must support immigrant-owned businesses who are disproportionately impacted. We must continue to improve language access across our city, and we must protect our families from evictions and homelessness. We believe that we can recover as a city that is better and more just for all. And as I conclude, I want to thank the many community members and partners, the council, so many who are working to support immigrant New Yorkers and fighting to make sure that nobody is left behind. I also want to thank my team, who has risen to the occasion uh, to jump in and really figure out how we adjust our work to address this moment as well. So thank you for allowing me to testify, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, and thank you so much for your uh, wonderful leadership as well. We really appreciate all you've done for our immigrant communities. Um, you know, you mentioned COVID-19 throughout your um, opening, and my district, which covers the Jackson Heights, Corona, and Elmhurst neighborhoods in Queens, has been what I term the epicenter of the epicenter when it comes to the pandemic. Uh, and in fact, recent data on uh, COVID-19 cases by zip code shows that nearly 50% of residents tested in my district 
have tested positive for the coronavirus. 50%, half of the people who live here. Can you talk about the city's outreach efforts in these neighborhoods specifically and the services provided to its residents? What additional services and support does the city plan to provide in these neighborhoods in the future? Because um, we really have been deeply, deeply impacted by COVID. And I dare say, because we have such a large population of immigrants here. Um, yes, thank you, council member. Uh, I, I first wanna express, uh, per, you know, personal um, uh, sentiments of um, sorrow and expression. I know you have lost a lot of loved ones, community members, neighbors, and this is a very difficult time. So thank you for your leadership and, and, and poise at this moment. Um, I think, uh, you know, always for us, the way that we both approach the work and look at how we can advance our city in a way that's more just for immigrant New Yorkers is looking at immigrant dense communities and the need to ensure that we are being intentional and targeted about what we're doing in these areas. And, and that was true when we launched IDNYC, right? And thinking about where our enrollment centers would be. It is true when we have looked at additional programming for legal services and so on and so forth. And certainly at this moment in time, a big part of our efforts in the Elmhurst area and community have been, I guess, I would say twofold. One is or threefold. One is um, robust outreach and engagement in the area to the to, of course, the best of our abilities at this moment. So we have worked to ensure that we are reaching community organizations and providers, I would say a, a, a large number of which are in those areas and operating in those areas, leaders and members that we have communication with and contact with, helping through that work identify the needs and the issues that have been elevated be it around food or burial assistance or healthcare access that we heard. Um, so we worked closely with the foods program to address where we heard there was over, uh, there was greater demand um, at particular schools for, for grab and go to increase the number of locations in the area. We worked with community members directly or organizations to help enroll folks in the food delivery program. Um, we recently distributed face coverings to um, many organizations across the city, many of which are in and around that area and working, um, have workers themselves or working with pantries or, or doing food delivery. Um, and we've had close coordination with health and hospitals um, through our, our ongoing work around NYC care. Um, we have uh, had uh, regular sort of office hours with health and hospitals for the organizations that help us conduct outreach um, so that we can receive feedback and information about what the needs are um, and what accessibility looks like. Um, and we've included um, health and hospitals as well in um, ongoing series that we've been doing with community and ethnic media to get information and word out, particularly around a recent one around testing um, and uh, telemedicine, as well as information about the hoteling program and others. That's some of what we've been doing. I can share a robust list of organizations that we've been working with, events, events that we've been doing in the area and so forth, but certainly concur with you about the importance of being very intentional about how we're being responsive. Thank you, you know, it broke my heart and I get emotional to think uh, when I, the first days of the virus, when it, of the pandemic, I was stood out in front of Elmhurst Hospital and I watched a cab driver pull over to the curb, pull his wife out of the back, put her over his shoulder and then stand in line to get into Elmhurst Hospital. It was just so, so emotional to see that happen and it's just very tough. We seem in many ways to, Elmhurst has done a great job, I have to say, and seeing and caring for everyone. Um, food remains an issue. Uh, sometimes we have, not sometimes, almost every day in my district at some site or another, uh, lines of 20 blocks long. I call them bread lines, soup lines, soup kitchens. Uh, 20 blocks long of immigrants mostly waiting to get in to get a grab and go or, um, or, or some type of food pantry. Um, I, at most of my grab and go sites in the district, they're serving over 4,000 people a day. Um, so many of these issues still remain 
even as um, states are beginning to open, um, we're still going to really feel the impact of, 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 of what I would consider to be long time neglect and inequality and equity uh, with regard to um, the folks who live in, in my community. So um, I thank you for your efforts. I just wanted to make sure that people understand exactly what's going on here in Jackson Heights and Elmhurst. And I know for Council Member Moya, it's very similar as well. So, but thank you for your efforts. Let me thank just you. talk a little bit about the public charge rule, which threatens the permanent status of immigrants who receive certain public benefits and has already caused many immigrants to forego food stamps and other programs before the pandemic. Did Moya conduct any outreach to ensure uh, that both the documented and undocumented uh, immigrants were informed about the eligibility requirements for the emergency food assistance program and home delivered meals. And can you describe those outreach efforts for me? Yes, thank you. Um, this, as you know, um, has been a long, um, unfortunately, road in terms of uh, doing everything that we can to combat the chilling effects and the impacts of the public charge rule. I will, will start by saying, um, importantly, that um, we have uh, sort of retargeted our efforts around this, both on the ground, which I'll describe in a moment, but also in the courts. So um, we are currently, as a part of the, the litigation with the Attorney General's office that the city is a part of, we are um, in court um, and had arguments as, as soon as, um, uh, I think this week, time is elastic, um, the 18th, um, and uh, fighting to uh, re-raise our concerns in light of the emergency that the implementation of the rule should be clearly halted um, at this moment in time. Our team worked diligently in the first um, kind of few weeks of the emergency order and, and, and um, in light of what we were experiencing and hearing on the ground to submit um, multiple declarations from myself and from others on my team that spoke to both what we were hearing and experiencing, but also our estimated impacts in support of that motion. Um, so j just because I think that that's critical, I want to ensure that people understand that that remains a fight um, that we continue and, and such a critical and important one. In terms of outreach and engagement on this, um, we work very closely um, across both the, the food programming, but kind of every agency that's been rolling out initiatives to ensure that there is clear messaging around seeking care without fear, that there's clear messaging in multiple languages, um, that there's messaging that's provided and shared that speaks to a recognition that people might have concerns, but if they do have concerns, that there are resources for them to be able to get those questions answered. So to be more clear, um, we, uh, we have uh, expressed um, and uh, communicated, obviously, the limitations to the public charge rule and its application. Um, that many people would not be impacted, that in fact, the kinds of um, services like the emergency food that we're talking about here would not be a part of a public charge consideration. In fact, most uh, New Yorkers who are eligible for SNAP um, or other benefits would also not be impacted by public charge determination. And so an encouragement for folks to seek those resources if they're entitled to them. And if there's a question or concern to, to get assurance to call our Action NYC hotline, which we have continued to be, um, to make available at this moment. Um, the team is teleworking uh, to man the phones of that um, hotline um, and is available to answer any questions or concerns that people may have on an ongoing basis. Um, and we've partnered with legal services providers to make sure that still, if there is an actual immediate concern, there can be immediate referral to help resolve the question or concern of the individual. So um, we, we continue to look at this, honestly. We've been working closely with the Department of Health at looking at broader strategy and public messaging around at benefits access and immigration because it remains um, constant and ongoing challenge, um, but it has been a, a focus for us. Thank you, Commissioner. 
And I know in your testimony, you mentioned the burial program. That also is a big issue here in our community. Uh, many folks want uh, their loved one's body to be sent back to the country that uh, of origin. Um, do, does the, the burial program include any help with that? Or can you just explain a little bit how it works and who they go to to seek help with burial? Sure. We might have a visitor here and there. Um, so um, this is a, this is a, you know, such a difficult moment in time. And I think as I, I've had um, expressed and shared in the sentiment with many of you, including Council Member Menchaca recently, um, you know, critically for, for me um, and for the work that we do has been, how are we ensuring we're treating everybody with respect and dignity in this process. And I know our colleagues at the Human Resources Administration have long advocated with the state, which helps um, with the reimbursement efforts on burial assistance in the existing program to increase the allocation amount um, to uh, low-income New Yorkers. Um, it is It has been quite low, right, $900. Um, and so, um, what we were able to do in concert with them is to uh, ensure that the burial assistance reimbursement amount or support amount is increased from $900 to $1,700 to adjust the cap through emergency rule, meaning that services previously had to come in at $1,700 or at least a receipt had to reflect that from a funeral home and now that is up to $3,400. Um, and then finally, to be inclusive, as I noted, to all regardless of status. And so I think importantly on this is um, the emergency rule also contemplates that uh, the window in which people could seek reimbursement. So even those who maybe were ineligible 120 days ago are now eligible to seek that reimbursement. So we want people who have incurred these costs um, to feel uh, able and know they have the right to now come and uh, seek that reimbursement at this time. It doesn't have to be, it's not forward looking alone. Um, and uh, that could be for any, any service um, that, that you were provided through funeral services, uh, funeral homes, et cetera, as long as you can um, demonstrate a, a receipt or bill uh, to that effect. And how do they, who do they contact to, uh get that benefit? Sure, so um, the HRA program is operating um, on the HRA website. There's information both by um, uh, fax, email, address, and phone on how people can access. Um, the phone is, is uh, as, my, as my understanding, has been the best way for people to access the services at this moment. Um, additionally, the team um, at HRA has been uh, opening the office one day a week for those who have challenges um, to, to do so by phone or email. Um, so that is now is, is good. It's live, it's active and, and working, and we encourage folks to access it. Also on our website, we have information uh, as well on this for those um, who need it and, and would like to access it there. Okay, thank you. Let me turn it over now to our co-chair, Carlos Menchaca. Thank you, Chair Drum. And again, greetings again uh, to you and your team, Commissioner Mustafi. I uh, am just kind of reviewing your testimony. You speak about the language access services that Moya provides, translation of documents, et cetera. And it looks like you might be even over budget in the number of requests that have come since COVID. Um, could you talk a little bit about that anticipation throughout the rest of the fiscal year and then really ensuring that we have enough for next year in the fiscal budget um, and the mayor's approach to ensuring that we have what we need from your perspective to get things translated uh, for uh, non-English speakers? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you know. I, I think as all of us, we're trying to look at the silver linings in this moment in time. And for me, one of the silver linings has actually been rethinking how we do language access and language services um, because we've uh, had to really, I think, appreciate the uh, urgency of the, the speed at which information goes out, how you can move things faster, how you can 
um, even better support agencies or guide agencies through that work. So, um, you know, this is something I'm sure we will debrief and digest for some time to reorient how we do the work. Um, but I would say in terms of the increase, yes, we've, we've outpaced, um, you know, tremendously um, kind of what we would normally do at this period of time. Um, we have not only readjusted the budget uh, to, to add more resources to uh, translation versus interpretation services, um, but we have in, we have gone beyond that. And so um, we have been assured by City Hall that we should keep going, that this is a priority, that um, there shouldn't be a limit to um, how we are um, uh, focused or prioritized on dissemination of multilingual information. We've been supporting other agencies in there who have, have as they should, contracts in, in translation and interpretation to make sure they have the resources that they need to continue to drive this work. Um, we've actually received some uh, assistance from translation uh, uh, agencies, additional assistance to the city as like a, as a, as, um, donation at this time as well. Um, and so, uh, as can I, I said- can I, pause, can I pause and just get a, a sense of numbers? How, how big are we talking in terms of the, the budget uh, accommodating all the new need? Sure. So um, uh, we have approximately about, about 500 or half a million dollars um, a year in our services budget, which is just the mayoral office. Um, for translation and interpretation. We, as I said, rededicated um, or pivoted all of the outstanding resources to this um, effort. Um, we will overspend that by about 50 or so thousand um, at least um, by the end of this fiscal year. Um, and that is after we took interpretation sort of allocation amounts and put them into translation as well. So I think that gives you a picture and we're kind of currently trying to understand the rate at which we're, um, we're spending and what it would look like uh, to keep that pace um, and also to um, factor back in interpretation. Well, I, I think that you're gonna hear from council members about the, the kind of gaps. That even as you ramp up, there's still a lot of gaps that are happening yep. uh, as we think about COVID uh, and other resources. And so I hope you hear that and we can get to a place where we can be robust in that area as we grow. One of the ideas that we put into our preliminary budget response was an interpreter bank, bank a language bank. And uh, I kind of wanted to get your response about that and how that can, can really help change the way that uh, I think for a long time now, the city has been um, in non-compliance around language access. It's just, it's always a, a kind of challenge uh, this can really change the game for legal services, health services, et cetera. Uh, what was the mayor's response to our recommendation for an interpreter bank? Um, so as I understand it on the recommendation specifically, there's ongoing conversations as a part of the budget process. I guess what I would add or say to that um, is, you know, we are always interested in looking at how do you, um, how do you do language access in a more effective, efficient way? And, and to the best of our abilities, um, recognize the importance of community members and leaders in that work, um, that uh, not just from a language access perspective, but from a workforce um, and uh, kind of uh, economic opportunity perspective at, at really utilizing the, um, importance of the skill that so many immigrant New Yorkers bring to the table in this work. So certainly uh, we support ongoing conversations um, about how to do that and to do it effectively um, and have um, ourselves looked look a lot at the, this question and, and others, including cooperatives and, and so forth. Okay, so it sounds like you, you're, you support that concept of just more language access, uh, interpretation services, the language bank sounds interesting. Let's just keep moving forward in conversations. Okay, so let's talk about some of the gaps. Uh, the burial fund, I just wanna say thank you. I know you've been fighting on the inside for this and we've had some really good calls on this. Um, the, though the application was only available in English until April or so, and the applica applications are now available in Spanish, 
and other languages. Can you tell us how many applications have been submitted in other languages so far and how many people have received that reimbursement? And um, are there dedicated caseworkers available to answer questions in those multiple languages as people engage the program? Yeah, so I can't speak to the specific questions. I'd have to defer to HRA and we're happy to do that and circle back to you. Um, in terms of since since April or March um, application receipt, I think what I would know um, and observed myself is that obviously there is um, uh, the, the 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 expansion of the amount and the inclusion of immigrant New Yorkers is is fairly new, and so part of our effort is to get that word out to make sure people are aware um, and able to access it, and that's why also the exact. Um, the emergency rule contemplates, as I said, a, a retroactive period, um, 120 days. So as to ensure that people aren't left out. Um, and so um, I don't know that the team has experienced yet sort of a big spike um, in applications, but that's why we need to get the word out and do the work together to do so. Um, the other questions around uh language and who has accessed um the the services so i know we've worked with hra in the last few weeks to make sure that the applications are available in different languages um we've also um, worked with them to ensure the language access um, is available as people are calling um, to receive the services and um, they have their own protocols, but additionally, um, some uh, of our IDNYC team who speak different languages are going to be supporting the, the burial assistance program at HRA at this time um, to further expand uh, multilingual workforce that will be working on this. Okay, so it sounds like you're reorienting the team uh, to fill the gaps and getting through 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 that. This, you know, the, I, I just mentioned the burial fund, but we're talking about so many different pieces. And I hope members kind of talk to you a little bit about those gaps, because uh, this is gonna be an ongoing conversation and something we need to bring into the BNT, the budget negotiating team conversation so we can make sure that that um, critical lifeline is supported. Uh, you can build an amazing program, but if people don't connect to it, it's not worth anything. Um, and so I know that you understand that and that we can figure that out. Let's move over to the stimulus. Uh, conversation, this larger kind of federal gap that now is on us to fill. And it's been a while now, four weeks, since the donation of the $20 million of private funding from the Open Society Foundation has happened and been announced. Can you let us know more about the role that you are playing as Moya and the Mayor's Fund in this process? And if there are any long terms planned for, um, for beyond that $20 million uh, private funding? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, and as I noted in the testimony, the this was a you know for early weeks priority for us, I and mean, we immediately understood, as many of you did, what was going to happen in um, the initial stimulus packages as we were monitoring them and also advocating around them. And um, our team, um, working with the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity, pulled together an impact analysis of who we thought would be left out of the federal stimulus um, and also, of course, um, is left out of the social safety net that um, is offered to uh, those with work authorization. And so um, we uh, worked with the Mayor's Fund to prioritize um, fundraising efforts um, for the uh, undocumented workers and families. We um, have also worked to help brief funders, um, donors, interested uh, partners um, on uh, the impacts so that they understand them um, and can think about and orient their response uh, accordingly. Um, and we're happy to say that through those efforts, we realized um, a partnership with the Open Society Foundation um, for $20 million, but also many, there are other funds across the city that um, additionally support emergency relief for immigrant New Yorkers, specifically undocumented New Yorkers. And we have been working to just try and remain coordinated um, across those funds, both in terms of um, understanding impact, but also understanding uh, sort of reach um, and uh, 
uh, where there might be ongoing gaps or challenges. Um, so the role that we played was really that is really sort of informing uh, what we thought the impact would be, what it would look like and mean. Um, and then from our, our own and ongoing work, um, really understanding what community-based organizations were best situated, um, both by way of their reach um, uh, with undocumented workers, um, but also sort of uh, in the work that they generally do to support a program like this. And um, as I will say often, uh, you know, $20 million is great. It is not nearly the, the need. And so there's a limit and there are challenges in figuring out how do you move quickly and reach people quickly in a smart, trusted, um, and uh, efficient way. Um, but but we know people will be left behind and out. And so that's why the coordination with other funds is important. It's also why we are trying through this effort um, to, re to receive uh, and analyze information about who we're reaching and how we're reaching them um, so that we can build on the work, um, so that we can continue to do uh, an analysis and evaluation of what the need is um, and continue conversations at all levels of government with private partners and philanthropy about what the need is. And in parallel, we have been doing advocacy um, at the federal level and in concert with other cities um, as well to uh, try and ensure that this next round of stimulus with a positive at least bill from the house um, maintains or uh, realizes greater relief for immigrant communities and families. Yeah, and we're all waiting for that. And until that happens, we need to fill the gap. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna bring in some other members to ask some questions and some on deck right now. And I'm just gonna say two things in response to that. One, you rely on a grid of nonprofits that are struggling right now to stay alive. And I hope we keep them alive because they are integral into everything you just said and disseminating. So I hope that we can ensure that they stay alive. Second, um, that money came in with strings attached and that that's real too. Private funding and the funds are gonna say, we want these funds to do X while city tax levy funding can be uh, what we need it to be. And we define those terms. Uh, and then the third thing I want to say, it's just not enough. And so I hope that later we can talk about what is enough and have you determined what that amount might be. Separate and apart from the budget constraints, what is that number? Um, and if you want to respond to any of us, that, that's great. But I'll hand it over to the chair to walk through some of the members who are on deck to ask questions. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair Menchaca. Let's go to our first council member question. Time any begins now. If any council member has questions for the administration, please use the Zoom raise hand function. You'll be added to the queue. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including answers. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to tell you when your time begins and the Sergeant will let you know when your time is up. We will now hear from council member Chin followed by council member Moya. Time begins now. I believe Councilwoman Chin is having problems with her microphone. Just give it one minute and then we'll go, we'll, we'll go to the next and come back to her. All right, let's go to our next council member and then we'll come back to council member Chin. Time begins now. Understood. We will now hear from council member Moya. Thank you, Chair Drum. Thank you, Chair um, Minchaka, for the great work that you guys have been doing. Uh, Commissioner, uh, always good to talk to you. Uh, thank you so much for the work uh, that's been uh, going on here. Just a quick question on adult literacy, if we could. Uh, it's two questions. One, uh, as of February 24th, uh, the federal administration finalized a rule uh, that would limit the access to social security uh, disability benefits for non-English speakers. Uh, that rule went into effect April 27th. Obviously, we know that it's clear that the federal administration is targeting uh, non-speaking, uh, uh, non-English speakers. Uh, how does this change the way in which Moya, uh, your Moya, and the administration prioritize uh, adult literacy services citywide? And has Moya conducted 
uh, an analysis on the impact this rule will have on immigrant New Yorkers. My second question, really quickly, uh, is uh, you know the administration and the council we've 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 gone into partnership in the past. Uh, we did a joint investment of twelve million dollars uh, for the adult literacy program uh, across the city for fiscal year twenty twenty. Uh, can you please share with us uh, the number of participants that were served for fiscal year 2020 and uh, the impact that it would have on fiscal year 2021 if we do not add the 12 million uh, in funding? Thank you. Sure, thank you for that question. Um, I think I would say a couple of things in response. Um, I think that the, the the broader need um, for adult literacy, the importance and recognition that um, you know we we estimate about twenty five percent of New Yorkers are limited English proficient, um, and and ne nearly half are um, uh, immer of immigrant New Yorkers are, are limited English proficient, and we know how important and critical the those services and programs are, and appreciate. Um, the priority that this has been um, for the council and, and others and, and year to year. Um, I, I guess I'll say a couple of things. In terms of the number of those served in the last year through that 12 million, I would wanna circle back with you to just make sure um, our colleagues at DYCD um, share the, the, the most recent um, number. I certainly know that it's in the thousands. Um, I know uh, just for our um, uh, kind of contributions to this work through We Speak NYC. It's, it's uh, you know, yearly it grows, every year it grows in terms of participation. Um, and at this moment in time, both our programming as well as the adult um, literacy programming through DYCD has moved to be virtual. Um, and it's really critical to, to recognize the, um, you know, what we see, the challenges that we see um, in uh, sharing of information in people knowing and exercising their rights and how fundamental English literacy is to ensuring uh, the support for both workers, but family members, parents whose children are, are going through um, the school process and who um, fundamentally, uh, you know, are going through a system that is both unfamiliar and then exa that's exacerbated by the, the English proficiency challenges. So certainly we share your, um, your concern um, in ensuring that there's um, ongoing support for this programming and this work. Um, we have understood that this is a part of ongoing conversations around the budget. Um, at this time and moving forward. And, um, you know, we know that year to year we have been able to come in with that additional support, but uh, appreciate that this is an ongoing conversation. And certainly we have elevated the importance of it from our perspective and our knowledge of how it's impacting our communities. And, and I just want to step in real quick because I have like 40 seconds, but just to that point is one of the reasons why I bring this up in, in uh, Chair Drum, who shares a lot of the school districts in, in, uh, in uh, Jackson Heights and Corona like I do, uh, this is critical. While we are now having our parents that uh, are teaching their kids at home, uh, we have one of the largest school districts with ELL learners. Uh, parents that uh, don't speak the language or uh, often the children are the translators for these parents. Uh, in this time of crisis where we're seeing that the immigrant community has been uh, uh, decimated by this pandemic. Uh, I'm by you. I implore you uh, to to fight to continue to get this funding in here. It is extremely critical on all levels, not just for uh, some of the reasons that you listed, but it has an effect on the children, the school districts, uh, in our communities. Uh, it is critical. And I know Chairman Chaka has been fighting uh, for this as well, but I just wanted to let you know how critical uh, that those twelve million dollars are. Um, for a lot of immigrant families uh, throughout the city of New York. Thank you. Yeah, if I could just build on two things. One, I failed to indicate, um, and I um, I don't, I, and again, we can circle back more on this, but our understanding is that the Democratic Chair of the House um, Committee on the Rule says that the impact would be about 10,000 
um, individuals or families. Um, and so to answer the first part of your question um, and to be responsive to the second and underscoring the importance of that, that's certainly something that we have heard from um, parents at this time. Um, it has been one of the reasons that the efforts of our team have been around uh, working with the Department of Education, both on accessing, um, uh, ensuring that people have access to devices. And we did a huge campaign um, around that. And actually DOE saw a spike in um, uh, requests for the devices that were in concert with some of the efforts that our team undertook. Um, and um, we are working closely with the Department of Education actually on doing professional development using We Speak NYC. Um, so we are, we are currently um, planning to launch a series of trainings for parent coordinators, um, family centers, and other teachers to um, uh, uh, help them use this. This is really, a, for us, has been intentionally a digital tool and a supplemental tool for ESOL teachers to utilize that focus on how uh, people who are learning English are also learning about civic participation and access to their rights um, and the importance of that kind of curricula. So I also just wanted to note, and I'm happy to circle back with more, that we're actually undertaking this effort with DOE right now um, in recognition and response to some of the challenges that we have heard. Great. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Thank you to both chairs. Thank you. Let's go to our next council member. We're going to circle back to Council Member Chin to see if her audio issue has been addressed. Council Member Chin. Time begins now. Okay. You hear me? Yep. Okay. I had to take my headset on. And I had to tell my husband to uh, give me five minutes. <laughs> He's conducting class. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, and to your team. Um, my question is like focusing back on language access. And I'm asking Moya's role in terms of coordination with city agency. It is not the first thing that the city agency think about. Like with the Department of Small Business Services, when they put out the grant uh, to the city grant, to, I mean, the, the grant and loan program, it was not translated. And it really took them a long time. And a lot of the immigrant uh, businesses was not able to take advantage, uh, not be able to, not able to apply on time and, and not able to get help. Um, and then also with the Get Food program, we have seniors who are calling and uh, everything is in English. So I think the coordination to make sure that the languages uh, are available is critical. And sometimes the city agency are not, you know, that's not their priority. They say, oh, it's translated on the website. I mean, come on, you know, it's, it, it takes always this a lag time. So I, I wanted to, to make sure Moyer have the funding and the resources um, to really take the lead um, on language access issue because we cannot rely on individual agency. That's one thing. The other thing is that um, when you were talking about private funding or there any kind of discussion with the city in terms of funding that they could put together that can help uh, immigrant families, small businesses, but they're not able to access a lot of the resources. And um, we talk about private funding, but it's very little. Uh, even right now, um, the good news about the pandemic snap uh, that each child is allowed um, to be able to access. That's a critical you know, resource, even though it's just a few hundred dollars. Um, how is the city uh, making sure that uh, family knows about that benefit? And also what other programs are available to help immigrant small businesses like street vendors to, able to be able to open back up when it's time to you know, open up again? Are there resources to help them, help these small businesses, immigrant businesses to be able to open their door back again to provide jobs and to service the community? Um, thank you, Councilwoman, and for all of your ongoing work and, and um, support um, on many of these issues for many, many years. Um, um, I would say uh, on the language access side, um, you know, uh, 
a, a couple of things. Um, one is this is a, um, as you all know, a, a, a multi-year um, uh, effort in ensuring that cities have in place um, as they do now, language access plans, coordinators, contracts um, to do this work. Um, and in reality, it is still new, right? It, um, the implementation of this work is only a couple of years old. Um, and so um, I think one of the things that we saw here early and we have been trying to address um, and I noted earlier could potentially be a silver lining um, of the crises is just the speed at which it takes to do the translation well. Um, and what we've been trying to strike the balance of is accuracy and speed, right? Quality of the translations, but also the speed at which information as well as content needs to be out there in the community. Um, and that has been a challenge. I, I just kind of bluntly want to state it very clearly it is As not the commissioner been i think on that point that we have to kind of get the city to acknowledge moya's role somebody has to take the lead and it cannot be the agency themselves i agree with you some of the translation is not that great but it's like we should rely on city agency i should not have to have my staff translate information for my constituent because the city agency didn't do it. That's why Moya needs to take the lead and have the funding resources and the authority on these so, language access. If you just allow the agency to do it on their own, it's not happening. It's not happening correctly. So I think the mayor needs to, you know, have your- Time expired. To charge. And, and, Can I, and I want to maybe responsive to the is it okay for me to be continue to be responsive to the council yeah, okay. comments and questions? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, so I appreciate your your sentiment. Look, I think um, as we have undertaken, we think they're both important. We think both agencies should learn to prioritize and, and do this work. And that's been a part of we do ongoing trainings, we provide best practices. Um, we work with them and provide technical assistance and support. As I said in my earlier testimony, we've seen an increase in people's coming to us to receive that technical assistance and support, which is great. We've been doing direct and intentional outreach where we see challenges. Um, but what I was articulating by the speed and the, the nature of it, I think is ex exists as a challenge for us too and something that we've been trying to work out. Just the importance of getting an application up and recognizing maybe it's not yet in the 10 languages. And so how do you strike the right balance? Um, and so that's an ongoing challenge that I just wanted to name because it's not insignificant and something that we've been trying to improve upon both in terms of speed and process to get things to move quicker. Um, but it is it's just an important thing to be conscious and aware of. Um, to answer some of your other questions, um, uh, you noted around um, small business support. Um, this has been an area where we agree with you. There have been many challenges at ensuring the inclusion of immigrant small businesses and accessing um, relief efforts and support at all levels. Um, we have been hyper-focused in the last few weeks on the um, federal SBA um, payroll protection programs and other initiatives. Um, we've worked diligently both um, with Univision, with cities across the country and, and experts on this locally on the ground with our small businesses services to make sure material is available. It's in multiple languages. Support is available in multiple languages. We've done webinars. We've shared out recorded webinars in Spanish. Um, we've had webinars done in, in other languages as well. Um, and so we agree and we think a part of the challenge has been structural, but a part of it has also just been um, what you articulated as getting information out in the right languages and providing support in the right languages. So that has been a concerted effort um, with SBS and us um, and others to do that work and get that information out. And we know it's been critical, not just for small businesses, but also community-based organizations, uh, uh, childcare locations, et cetera. And so that's one piece. Um, we also have been working through our efforts 
Um, we know uh, with Open Society and the Mayor's Fund to ensure inclusion of street vendors um, who have been left out of um, these other relief efforts. Um, again, limited, but still uh, identified and some resources um, to be- Commissioner, can I pause you? Um, I, there are a couple more members that need to ask some questions before before we run out of time. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, want to take them and then I'll try to be responsive. Yeah. And so let's just keep your, your responses uh, just a little bit more more uh, clear. And I just want to frame uh, for, for myself uh, the kind of both uh, Councilmember Moya and uh, Chin that there's a there's a question about accountability. Who is accountable? And and I believe the mayor's office of immigrant affairs is accountable to ensure that everybody is is not in an educational uh, way learning how to do this, but held accountable to the immigrant community. And I think that's what's been lacking for a long time. We've been we, this is a battle we've been having for a long time. This is a resource question and an infrastructure question. Uh, and anything that you say in terms of what you've done is just not enough. It's not getting to where it needs to get to. So I appreciate your your kind of review, but it's just it's not enough, and we need to solve it, and we need to solve it in this budget coming forward. Uh, Chair Drum, yes, thank you, uh, Chair Menchaca. Before we move to our next uh, questions, let me say that we have been joined by Council Members Lewis, Powers, Chin, Amphrey, Samuel, Ayala, Yeager, Moya, Cornegy, Van Bramer. Jonai and Rosenthal, and I believe we have two more questions. Yes, we will now hear from Councilmember Rosenthal followed by Councilmember Lewis. Time begins now. Great, thank you so much. Sorry, I'm a little bit not quite set up, um, but thank you and, and thank you commissioner for your time. Um, I'd like to ask about your role, and I think this is part of the theme of what people are talking about is how we elevate the role of Moya, um, but what has your agency's role been as it has to do with domestic violence messaging? Um, are you being engaged in this? Uh, yeah, just what's been your interaction with uh, NGBV? Um, thank you for the question. So we we do work closely with NGBBV. We speak regularly, both in terms of kind of information sharing and understanding what each of our teams are doing and where we can support one another. Um, we um, uh, we share work around our task force for um, uh, immigrant crime victims and trafficking victims, and so this has been an area of focus. At, as well at this moment in time um, that we've undertaken with them. Um, and also, of course, to support them, we actually do the language services for their, um, language access services for their work as a mayoral office. Um, so- You mean I, at the I, Family I, Justice Centers? For, yeah, for, for um, NGDBV. Yes, any request that they have of us, we will do. Have they requested that you translate their materials into the required 10 or 16 languages, whatever it is? Um, I would I would wanna go come back to you um, with greater specificity on what they have requested. I know they have had requests, but I, I would wanna circle back with you on, on what in particular we have translated for them. During COVID, so just during the last eight weeks. Yeah. If that's what you're interested in, in, yes, I can get the last eight weeks. So, um, and do you, if they asked for your help um, getting uh, the message about domestic violence, the variety of messages out, do you have a network that you could use to get the, those messages out, whether they be um, a variety of social media, flyering, whatever it may be? Yeah, we have actually, I know, um, worked with them on getting out messaging through our networks that they have produced. Um, we have done so both digitally, but also we do community um, blasts as well as community. Right, but messaging. I mean, which message have you been getting out via these mechanisms? I'm happy to share with you which messages and, um, as I said, which translations. I know we have been working with them and we have received messaging that we have shared out. I don't wanna misquote which, which ones at this time because we do so many. 
Um, and so I would rather just circle back with affirmation for you of, of the things we've shared. So it's concerning to me that the one thing that came to mind for you was around sex trafficking um, because domestic violence is so much bigger than that. And I, I, I'm not putting you on the spot at all. What my point of what I wanna get to is, is the administration giving your agency enough money to do and enough staff and enough access to, um, I guess, media outlets um, and links and other things like that to get important messages out. Um, you know, when I asked the chancellor, Department of Education chancellor about this, he immediately said that um, the grab and go sites had uh, domestic violence uh, flyers right there. And, uh, you know, couldn't answer the question about languages or anything like that, but right away he knew that. Now it could be because he was prepped, but uh, because I've been asking all the commissioners and I've been pushing on the grab and go sites. It just strikes me that your agency could be one that could be used to get, you know, we're, we're already seeing a spike in domestic violence. There's an expected 30% increase uh, in domestic violence. Um, I think the immigrant communities, you know, not having access to information that all the services are out there and available to them. Shelters are open and available and they're trying to keep them COVID free. The if you Time call expired. The police will come, et cetera. I just wanna know that your agency has the resources it needs to do this important work. Councilwoman, I just wanna correct what you said. I didn't just go to sex trafficking. I said- My bad, I shouldn't have said that, I'm sorry. I yeah, I just think this is important. We, we share a task force and work with NGDBV around U visas, which is for all crime victims, including domestic violence survivors, as well as trafficking, which is what I was sharing. So we've had a shared effort to ensure that that work is continuing and we're addressing any challenges at this moment in time. And in terms of information shared, it is broadly, I know about the family justice centers, the access to those, that the domestic violence hope line remains available. I just didn't want to limit or not give you everything that I know we have shared Fair. and work with them to get out. Fair, I appreciate that. I'd love some follow-up. Okay, thank you very much. Thank I want you. to say we have been joined by Majority Leader Lori Cumbo and by Council Member Koslowitz. Uh, are there any further questions, Committee Council? Um, yes, um, we will now hear from Council Member Lewis. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair Robin Chaka. Time begins now. Um, two quick questions. One of them you touched on already, but it wasn't quite clear. So I said, let me just ask. Um, regarding the stimulus for und undocumented, how were the 30 organizations, uh, the 30 CBOs picked for the program? And do those C CBOs have the capacity um, to provide all... I wanted to know exactly what are the languages that they would be providing assistance with? Because sometimes they don't really cover everything like Urdu, Creole, Yiddish. It's usually like one or two. So I wanted to know, do these CBOs have the capacity uh, to help in all languages? Because um, I think Council Member Chen mentioned it earlier, the concerns with not coordinating with our offices um, to provide suggestions and opinions on how we can better help and serve and support you. And the second question is in regards to the census. Um, I know we have to continue to practice social distancing. So I wanted to know, do you have dedicated staffers um, that are solely um, working on census outreach? How many and what does that look like moving forward? Thank you. Sure, thank you for the question. I'll start with census um, and say that we have been partnered with census uh, the census team since the outset and making sure both that we're helping to inform the engagement and work with immigrant New Yorkers, um, but also that our team is supporting them in everything that they're, they're undertaking to get the word out. And we have been particularly focused at this time, um, uh, I would say specifically in areas where we know the undercount has been severely 
uh, great, um, especially in certain uh, areas, um, uh, immigrant dense communities, um, like in Queens and other areas. So our team has participated in a number of the um, efforts and out outreach engagements um, with the census team. And again, if you want specifics on sort of the, um, the tools or the events, um, we can share that, but we include census both in our immigrant resource guide and the updates that we've been sharing out for New Yorkers, as well as in the virtual events and engagements that we've been doing um, as well. Um, and uh, we, in, the la in March, actually released with census two videos um, that our team helped develop um, through our We Speak NYC program that are specifically geared to informing immigrant New Yorkers who are limited English and proficient and speaking to sort of the key issues for immigrant New Yorkers around census. And we have been both teaching through with utilization of that program through our classes, um, as well as sharing that out more broadly um, with community organizations and others. So that's some of what we've been doing on census, but I will, but oh, I'm happy know, we're, to we're not getting that information. So I don't know who's providing that at your office. It would be great to, to get access to that information. I wanted to know if it was in other languages. I, I do see it sometimes, but what about folks that are part of the digital divide that don't have access to that? How are we reaching that population? That's really important. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll make sure to share those resources with you, of course. Um, and I you know this, we've supported the census team um, in other ways through um, uh, uh, text messaging, through um, apps that we know communities are using, um, through uh, video sort of uh, messaging in different languages. Our team actually developed uh, uh, videos in different languages that they shared out on telephone communication chats and other channels for community members. So we've done a lot, but I'm also happy to circle to make sure you have the resources that we've developed and utilized um, to be able to share out if you don't. Um, um, on the first question in terms of the fund, I think the, as the council member um, rightly articulated, um, there were certainly certain uh, priorities or goals um, through the effort uh, and uh, through the work that the Mayor's Fund has been doing in partnership with OSF to make sure we were reaching undocumented workers across the city and sort of the analysis for the fund is based on that impact. Um, and so, uh, you know, the Mayor's Fund uh, looked both at, at worker, worker industries to make sure that it was inclusive um, as well as geography and um, to your, more specifically to your point, language. Um, I, my understanding is that there are about um, 20 plus languages that the community-based organizations speak um, and, and are able to conduct uh, um, the, the process um, and outreach in, um, in support of um, fund distribution. And Time expired. And last thing I would say is that we are we have made ourselves available to support with additional language um, capacity or support needs. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chairman Chaka. Any final words before we close this section out? Yeah. No. Nope. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you to, thank you to the, the finance team for putting this together. Uh, Commissioner, we had a lot of other questions prepared. We never even had our uh, mainly because of COVID, our preliminary hearing. There's a lot of, of kind of detailed work that we want to do on the budget analysis. Uh, can you commit to responding to our written questions? Sure, happy to, to look at the questions and see what we're able to provide, yeah. Okay, thank you. The, the, the last piece is really a, a, a kind of um, reorientation around services for immigrants. And as we think about COVID and our response and where the mayor has really pushed for services around hospitals and, and whatnot, I think this conversation that you're hearing today is about ensuring that our most vulnerable people have services, legal, healthcare, education, census outreach, connection through legal services. Are you... Are you prepared to talk about how the mayor's office is thinking about all those services as essential and how you're tracking those 
as they hit every agency to ensure that there is real advocacy at the end of the day for each agency to take those things on as essential. Are immigrant services essential in this budget? Um, I, I don't, I just wanna make sure I understand your question correctly, um, or at least I'll try to answer it and then tell me if I have. Um, so, um, you know, I think a couple of things. I think uh, we've all, all understood, certainly our own research and data from our team has, has elevated and made um, public um, that we know disparities exist um, and that they have long existed and that we need to be- well, up, right? And we need to think about solutions that look at how they address them. Um, and uh, we've seen some progress over the course of the last few years in particular on health and health access. Um, and we are hoping to, to sort of address that full divide as we move towards a full NYC care rollout um, and, and continuing to prove, improve upon that work. Um, but, but to answer your question simply in, in the interest of time, um, yeah, we're, you know, we're looking at all of this. We looked at, the, you know, the impacts of overcrowded housing and the ability to recover and really pushed and advocated for the hoteling program. We're looking at food access and how we can ensure we're being equitable and inclusive of New York, of immigrant New Yorkers. So that is the orientation that we have, I think, in specific on how we're look, we're tracking some of these things. I think that can often be challenging, um, especially in real time. I know um, for example, Small Business Services is trying to better understand right now, given available data, the impact um, on small businesses, but happy to sort of better understand your question too and make sure we're, we're being thoughtful or considerate in the work that we're doing. Thank you. And, and maybe my, my final point before I hand it back to the chair to close this, this hearing is that we know from our constituents, and you've heard it through the members who spoke out through the questions that our immigrants and our families, uh, especially our undocumented families are essential to the recovery for uh, the city. And that everything that is connected starts with connection through communication and, and then building out the programs. And that is what I think is needed in this budget to connect to our legal services where ICE is still working uh, to deport our neighbors and our healthcare access to ensure that people who are eligible SNAP and food, all these spaces where there is responsibility from the agencies like yours to ensure that that happens um, or else recovery is not gonna happen. And we're gonna see some major, and we're already seeing it, uh, decay of, of, of civic society in our, in our neighborhoods. Um, and so your input is gonna be important as we finalize this budget. And the real empowerment that I'm feeling right now is that the city council has the power to really build this budget. Uh, and while there's gonna be some divide, we will have the ultimate power uh, to send you a budget this next fiscal year. And I'm committed to ensuring that the immigrant communities are heard and built into this budget. I hope you're all ready to catch that and, and really continue to rise because you all, you all have Rosen to this place of, of action, but that we take it to another level. Uh, and that's, that's in the future of the city and that's integral. And so let's keep talking. We have a lot of questions for you uh, as we build the, the rest of this budget. Thank you to you and your team for the work that you do every day. And uh, thank you to our staff and our side as well. Thank you everyone. Uh, just before we close out commissioner, I had wanted to ask you about the open society money. Um, can you get, quickly give us a little description of what's going on with that? Um, uh, who's getting that funding, et cetera? Sure, I spoke briefly to this and uh, again, happy to circle back if um, a question goes unanswered. Um, so the mayor's fund is actively uh, working to finalize um, contracts with a network of over 30 organizations community-based providers across all five boroughs, as I said, speaking over 20 languages, um, working with uh, undocumented workers from domestic workers to construction workers, street vendors, nail salon workers, et cetera. Um, and uh, the, um, the effort begins essentially now. Um, and I know we've, we've briefed um, um, you council member and, and several others on 
um, how best to uh, refer or share information to those who are in need of this relief and recognizing the limitation and that it will move fast. Um, it is $20 million, but that only serves up to 20,000 families. Um, and so our team remains available. Folks can reach out to us. Um, constituents can reach out to us um, as well. And we're happy to support to continue to direct folks. Our community services line remains available to support in this effort as well as others. And we have actually seen a large spike of immigrant New Yorkers calling us for support at this time. Okay, and just finally, um, do you have to be a member of these organizations in order to receive the services? No, council member. The eligibility is, that the mayor's fund has included in its contracts is simple. It's you're a New Yorker or based in New York, you are ineligible for um, federal relief or social state cash assistance programming, um, and you've experienced some level of income uh, loss at this time or need. That's it. So no, no, no other eligibility requirement um, is, is a part of the program. Okay. Thank you very much, Commissioner. We appreciate you coming in. I want to thank my co-chair, Carlos Menchaca, as well. We wish you luck as we go through the uh, pandemic and uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank uh, you, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Commissioner. My uh, obligation is here. Uh, this will conclude this portion of today's hearing. Uh, we will now hear from the New York City Controller. Um, after, we'll start with the Controller in about five minutes. Uh, we'll come back and reconvene. For those of you who are, um, uh, staying on, please stay on the Zoom conference and then we'll start in five minutes and uh, mute yourselves for five minutes. Thank you very much.
Speaker is on the floor. Chairs, we are ready to begin when you are ready. Thank you. Ready? Good morning and welcome to the City Council's sixth day and final hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 21. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Speaker of the Council, Corey Johnson, we will now hear from the New York City controller, Scott Stringer. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues that have joined us. And they are, bear with me one minute. Council members a Adams, Amprey Samuel, Grudenchik, Minchaka, Ayala, Lewis, Moya, Yeager, Kostowitz, Kumbo, Chin, Jonai, Holden, and Eugene. <clears throat> In the interest of time, I will forego my opening statement, but I will turn it over to the speaker for his opening remarks. Mr. Speaker. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Drum. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Comptroller. It's a pleasure to see you as always and thank you for testifying at this executive budget hearing and we want to again send you our um, condolences uh, for the loss of your mom a former member of this body we have been thinking about you and your family uh, during this difficult time i think that you'll agree that now more than ever the city's leadership needs to work together towards the common purpose of stabilizing the economy recovery and providing assistance for those who have been hardest hit by the pandemic. We each have a role to play in this process. And over the next few weeks, the council must adopt a budget that is fiscally sound, responsive to the COVID-19 crisis and does its best to protect the social safety net. And we look to you, Mr. Controller, to ensure that the priorities uh, of our budget are set and that the agencies execute their work with integrity and efficiency 
and also to provide guidance on managing our long-term budgetary needs like pensions, capital borrowing, and cash flow. And to that end, uh, we will have a few questions after you are uh, done testifying to hopefully allow us to engage in a constructive dialogue on our city's fiscal health and the available budgetary options that we have to manage this crisis. And I look forward to that conversation. So I will keep it at that. I'll uh, turn it back over to uh, Chair Drum so that we can hear your opening statement. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you. We'll now hear from New York City Controller Scott Stringer. The controller is joined by Preston Neblack, Deputy Controller for Budget. Will the committee council please administer the affirmation? Thank you. I will now administer the affirmation one time and you will be called on individually to so affirm. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Controller Stringer? Yes. Mr. Neblack? Yes. Thank you. Controller Stringer, you may begin when ready. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the City Council, Chairman Drum, members of the Finance Committee. Uh, I want to say, first off, thank you to Speaker Johnson, not just for being here with me today, but also the way he reached out uh, when my mom passed away, both personally and at the City Council meeting. Uh, Carlos, uh, who's the former City Clerk of your legislative body, was very proud and honored. So you really gave our family a, a sense of great respect and I will always be grateful to that. So thank you, Speaker uh, Johnson and to all the members who reached out. And I also wanna say thank you as I do every year for the opportunity today to discuss the city's fiscal year 2021 executive budget. As you know, I always bring President Niblack uh, along for the testimony and I'm, he's here today. Uh, now all of you know, so much has changed since I appeared before you in March to discuss the mayor's preliminary budget. The world in which we find ourselves today looks completely different. We've all seen the headlines, our economy is suffering. States and cities across the US have closed non-essential businesses to protect public health and flatten the curve. While that was the right decision, it has provoked the steepest, deepest recession in modern times. This year's economic downturn is likely to be twice as deep as the Great Recession a decade ago. Here in New York City, Mayor de Blasio ordered non-essential businesses to close more than eight weeks ago. And since then, unemployment claims have skyrocketed. As of last Thursday, more than 930,000 New York City residents had filed for unemployment. That's almost one out of four working New Yorkers. The job losses are steepest in those sections where interaction with the public is greatest, hotels and restaurants, stores and theaters, healthcare and social assistance. The workers in these sectors are already among the most vulnerable and economically insecure in our society, in low wage jobs, living paycheck to paycheck, and facing systemic barriers to housing, healthcare and other basic needs. The drop in economic activity is deeper than any we've ever seen in such a short period. And the pace of recovery will depend above all on solving the health crisis. We can only open our economy safely after there's widespread testing data. That data will determine when and how quickly we can begin to safely and responsibly relax social distancing. Some parts of this economy will recover more quickly than others. And that will depend on many factors. For example, how quickly will people decide to travel to New York again? Will theaters, museums, or sports be able to reopen if social distancing lowers the number of people who can congregate? Can restaurants survive if they can only have half as many customers as before? All of this will determine how fast our economy recovers and how complete that recovery will be. Now, let me now turn to how all this impacts our city's finances and how the mayor's executive budget proposed uh, is proposed to address these challenges. Now, let's, stay, let's step back for a moment to the mayor's preliminary budget back in January before the COVID-19 pandemic struck our city with a vengeance. The budget for fiscal year 2021 that the mayor presented then was $95.3 billion. The outlook for gaps in later years was around $2.5 billion. But between the January preliminary budget and the April executive budget, the shutdown of our economy resulted in budget gaps totaling $8.7 billion combined over the rest of this year and FY21. The loss of 7.4 billion in tax revenues was the main factor. 
But the shutdown also means lost revenues from building permits, parking tickets, and other fees and fines. And the state balanced its own budget by cutting or nearly shifting 800 million onto the city books. The mayor relied on three main strategies to address the gap for 2020 and 2021. First, we received roughly 2 billion in federal stimulus aid. Second, the mayor ordered a savings or PEG program of 2.7 billion. And third, the mayor drew down uh, reserves for nearly half the total, over $4 billion. So let's start with federal aid. The enhanced federal share of Medicaid spending will cover about 500 million this year and 444 million next year. The coronavirus relief fund for state and local governments is providing 800 million more dollars to cover COVID related spending needs. And FEMA will cover about 250 million in uniformed overtime for COVID response. But obviously what we've received so far comes nowhere near to covering the huge loss in tax revenues we've suffered because of the shutdowns. Now let's uh, take a look at the PEG program that the mayor included in the exec budget. Unfortunately, most of the savings for 2021 are achieved by suspending or delaying programs for only one year because the mayor assumed that a continued need for social distancing would prevent them from operating. And that includes, among other things, programs that last year benefited some 175,000 city youth, including the Summer Youth Employment Program and several after-school programs. And I want to be clear. Not only do these one-time cuts leave our city's youth high and dry this summer, but they don't translate into long-term savings. In fact, Reoccurring savings are only a small fraction of agency budgets because the mayor simply didn't ask most agencies for reoccurring savings at all. Too much agency spending is simply on autopilot, but it's no longer possible to do business as usual. Through our audits, we identify wasteful practices, uncollected revenue, and simple sloppiness that cost the city millions of dollars. And for the past three years, I've been highlighting spending that simply doesn't seem to achieve results through our agency watch list, including billions spent on homelessness without reducing the number of homeless, hundreds of millions spent on bloated overhead and unnecessary contracts at the Department of Education, and millions spent on mental health programs without demonstrating results. In March, I urged the mayor to task all agencies with identifying 4% of their budgets for reoccurring savings. If agencies had met that challenge and achieved that 4% target, now that would be worth another nearly $1 billion a year. My office has instituted a 4% peg. I'm calling on all city agencies and elected officials to do the same. We got to lead by example, and we need to do this now to protect our social safety net and programs that serve the most vulnerable New Yorkers. The city should have started saving a long time ago. Expertise and experience teaches us that a responsible budget cushion equals at least 12% of spending. Despite 10 straight years of economic expansion, the city is $1.2 billion below the mark. This is money that would have been enormously helpful during the city's current financial strain. So what concerns me the most is how deeply we've dug into our reserves, which as I've noted for years, weren't nearly big enough to begin with. At the beginning of this fiscal year, we had 6.1 billion in reserves. However, between this year and next, we're using up to 2.6 billion in surpluses from the Retiree Health Benefit Trust and leaving just 100 million in the contingency reserves for next year. We are not leaving ourselves much room for ever, era, and that's all the more reason why it's imperative to start saving. Yes, now we gotta save. Now, where does that leave us? As I said in the beginning of my testimony, a great deal has changed since January. The mayor's executive budget for fiscal 21 is $89.3 billion, $6 billion less than the prelim budget, and the gaps in the out years have nearly doubled compared to the preliminary budget. With reserves this low and a PEG program that relies heavily on one-time actions, we should be extremely concerned about how we'll be able to address those out year deficits. If the situation wasn't troubling enough, the state budget update has made it crystal clear. The state enacted budget was based on pre-COVID revenue estimates and a lot of hope for federal aid. The budget update burst that bubble, revealing a $13.3 billion budget gap in the state's current fiscal year. To close that gap, the state is proposing to cut $8.2 billion in local aid. Assuming New York City's share of these cuts is proportionate to its share of state aid, 
we're looking at an additional $3 billion cut that will fall almost heavily on our students because two thirds of local aid is education. To be clear, nothing I've said here today accounts for these potential cuts because we simply don't know what and how much they will be, but we do know there's a potential for devastation. The solution to the state budget problems cannot just be cuts to our schools. We must look at all options, including revenues, to avoid an outcome that would harm an entire generation of children. At the outset of this crisis, Trump and the federal government utterly abdicated their responsibility to prepare and protect this country. We're now racing against time and paying a heavy price for their negligence. There is no silver bullet to economic recovery, but federal leaf money is the closest we can get and we need that money now. State and local governments across the country are spending tens of billions of dollars fighting this pandemic. Most of them acted to protect their citizens by shutting down non-essential businesses and it's costing them hundreds of billions of dollars in lost revenue. There's no way for us to make that up by ourselves. Congress must step up. And I wanna thank our New York congressional delegation for fighting tirelessly in Washington for the relief we need. Relief funds must prioritize need, not politics. New York City with more than 190,000 cases gets the equivalent of $7,500 per COVID case. While Montana with 470 cases got 2.7 million per case. This is an outrage. Our communities are suffering and we need help. The next stimulus bill must use a fairer formula that recognizes the caseloads and economic impact are much more severe in some places than in others and distributes funding based on those needs. New York is the nation's economic engine. Our residents and businesses contribute more to the federal budget and get back less than any other state, $22 billion more in 2019, in fact. Other states contribute less and get more back. In other words, our taxpayer dollars are funding relief efforts across the country while we are left to fend for ourselves. There's no denying it. We are facing one of the most trying times in our history. This pandemic has laid bare the deep systemic inequalities that run through our society. We're seeing up close how the right to basic health, safety, and economic security are too often denied along the lines of race and class. Any strategic approach to recovery must center these communities, address these disparities, and lift up those who are isolated, overwhelmed, and in dire need. That means investing in historically disinvested neighborhoods where residents are more susceptible to illness because of overcrowded housing and poor air quality. It means strong lines of communication with our workforce, industry, and health experts to bring back our economy sector by sector safely, fairly, thoughtfully, and sustainably. It means widespread testing and tracing capabilities at the scale needed to reopen our economy. When we look back at this time, I wanna be able to say that our government stood up for our city, marshaled all our resources, and did everything we could to save lives and get our economy back on track. This is personal to me in two ways, not just the loss of my mom, but raising two kids, remote learning in public school. I look at them every morning and I just wonder, are we doing enough for them as well? So I'm happy to be here with the city council who gets it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Chair Drum. I understand this is the most uh, record turnout for me testifying at a council hearing. So it's exciting for me personally. Uh, maybe all just like remote learning, but I'll, I'm, I'm remote. <laughs> I didn't mean that. I meant maybe we like it on remote, but uh, I'm really glad all of you are here so we could have a discussion. And now I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. I'm going to go right to our speaker who has questions. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Chair Drum. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Comptroller. I just want to, uh, looking at your testimony, I just want to um, go back and you mentioned that you believe uh, there's a loss of $7.4 billion in uh, tax revenue and then additional $800 million that was cut by the state, which is putting this projected budget hole uh, for the current fiscal year we're in and the next fiscal year, at least above $8 billion, but that number could grow. What is your office's estimate? I see $8.7 billion is what you put 
in the testimony. Is that your estimate, your office's estimate of what the hole is right now for our city's budget for the next two fiscal years? Yes, and um, look, it's subject to change. I mean, I'm trying to keep coming back, re-looking at the numbers. You know, we said like a week ago that, well, we're gonna, we anticipate having, for example, 900,000 unemployment claims, people unemployed by June. Well, it's June and we're already at 930. So it's very likely we'll update that. We peg it at 8.7. Um, we could be more pessimistic depending on the analysis, but that's where we stand right now, Mr. Speaker. Okay. I wanted to just ask about property taxes and, and interest rates. Um, you <clears throat> represent, <clears throat> excuse me, you represent one of three votes on the city's banking commission. And this year the commission recommended a late payment interest rate for quarterly property taxpayers to be lowered from the current uh, late payment rate of 7% down to 3.25% in the first quarter of fiscal 2021, and then 5% for the rest of the year. Uh, the commission also went beyond its mandate to suggest that the city create a 0% interest program for COVID impacted quarterly payers However, the commission recommended that the 18% interest rate for semi-annual payers remain unchanged. And we are really glad that the commission built off some of the council's recommendations that we put in our preliminary budget response for property tax uh, deferral programs. And we welcome suggestions and we wanna work together on what we should be doing for quarterly payers. Who do you think should qualify for the 0% interest rates? Should landlords qualify? Should high income homeowners qualify? I'd love your thoughts on how we should be thinking about this as we're looking at the budget over the next six weeks. Oh, it's, a, it's a very fair question. The, the, uh, the, co the collaboration with the mayor's office resulted in lowering that burden for as many people as possible. But I agree with you, it's a work in progress and perhaps uh, we can have Preston and your staff look at different recommendations. We'll have to bring the mayor's office in as well, but it is something that we should be focused on as you have been, so thank you. Do you think the landlord should qualify for, for the reduced rate? You mean a homeowner with somebody who they're renting an apartment to in, I don't know, Brooklyn or Queens, you mean? Uh, well, there are, there are high income homeowners who may not have been impacted by this. I mean, well, look, like, I, I, how, how are we determining who, do you have to be COVID impacted to qualify? It's a, it's a, good, it's a good series of questions. Obviously we wanna target the people who have been most impacted. As you know, based on the data we've provided you and others, uh, the disparity uh, in income, uh, and health disparity in so many of our targeted communities, it's pretty clear that that's where the need has to be. That's where we should go first. And I do think we should develop a comprehensive package related to that kind of relief. There's a lot of homeowners who are struggling every day. Obviously a landlord who's doing really well is not the person I'm gonna target first, but I do think there's a lot that we can do to round this out. You know, this was a, pretty good collaboration with the mayor uh, where we really looked at the banking commission and looked at these issues and I signed off on it because it was doing something that we hadn't done before. And do we have any uh, estimate at this point? Does your office have any estimate on how a program like this, uh, given the uh, number of people that have been impacted by COVID-19 and may want to take advantage and use a program like this, how that would impact the city's cash flow? Well, I think that everything that we look at as it relates to cash flow, uh, we are monitoring almost on a daily basis. Uh, right now, we have uh, $5 billion in cash. We're not in any cash crisis in the short term. Uh, we continue to look at those issues. So I do think that we could certainly handle what we did or we wouldn't have done it. Um, but we are looking at cash. Look, the, 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 what I can tell you today is our estimates. We've really never gone through this situation, so it is subject to update and change. And I think in the budget negotiations with the mayor, you guys are probably, or you folks are gonna probably have to, council's gonna have to be very nimble in how we react to these changes and, and try to get to where we need to be on an adopted budget. 
And why did the commission make a recommendation to leave the 18% interest rate unchanged? Look, I think it's the beginning of a larger discussion, as I mentioned before. We should be talking to the council. We should come to terms on this. This was a first cut to get something done. Uh, the mayor uh, played a real leadership role in this and we signed off on it. But there's no question that is part of your due diligence and budget negotiations. This is a wonderful opportunity for you and the mayor to continue what was built on and, and I'll work with you on it 100%. Great. So I wanted to just get a sense. Um, uh, I think your testimony was very helpful today on, and I agree with much of what you said, uh, but what are the metrics that you think are most important to determine the city's fiscal health moving forward? What are the things that we should be looking at to determine what our fiscal health is like as we are uh, trying to recover? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a broad question, but I could give you, you know, some historic, historic perspective. You know, this is not our first rodeo, or this is certainly un, an unprecedented situation. Uh, I would go back to the fiscal crisis in the 70s and look at building the broadest coalition and a broadest package of relief, both to our community's hardest hit, but also looking at a real savings plan, coming up with a coalition to go to Washington to get the money we're owed. There's a lot in our history that could put you going forward. When you look at uh, the Great Recession and the moves that the council and the mayor had to make, uh, again, there's a historical perspective here. Right now, I think the biggest challenge for us is federal stimulus dollars. We must mm -hmm. get that money. Without it, we are in a permanent, permanent hole that I'm not sure we can get out of. Second, we've got what, to what, stave off those what, state cuts, my friend. Let me, let me say, we have to stave what, off state cuts. We don't know what's coming that way. So we have to be very prudent in terms of savings, agency efficiencies. You know, I come to the council every year and I say, please save, save, save as if our city depends on it. It's hard to get people to think about saving when times are good. Uh, when I came to the council in February and said save in good times, I didn't realize that two weeks later we would be in the midst of something that who could have imagined how dire this would be economically. But I do think we need to do everything we can to show Washington that we're ready to take action. Every dollar that we spend now must have a measurable impact on the city. If we have a program, it has to show results. If we can save by getting rid of outside contracts, bloat at the different agencies that we've long talked about, I think we can create a base of money for 20 and 21. And then all hands on deck, Washington working with Gillibrand, Schumer, working with our uh, great congressional delegation. That is how I would approach in the short term at the, the economy of closing budget gaps. Obviously, turning on, the com turning on the economy is gonna be a much more intense, serious conversation. My view is that we should help, we should use science as our friend and medical advice or medical expertise. That's why I have a problem moving contact tracing out of the Department of Health, because we've got a health department and expertise. And I think there's a lot that we can do together to open up this economy slowly and carefully uh, because obviously lives will depend on the decisions we make and we have to figure out what our risk tolerance is uh, through the lens of what's medically appropriate. And what if, uh, Mr. Control, what if we don't get the federal money that we're all fighting for by the uh, end of June statutory deadline, we have to pass uh, a balanced budget by state law. So if we don't get those billions of dollars that was put in that house bill uh, that the House passed a little more, you know, than a week and a half ago. You know, what, 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 what is your, what do you think we should do if, if that money doesn't come through before July first, and we have uh, at least an eight and a half billion dollar hole in our budget? What is, what's your suggestion on what we should do? Well, my my view is you have to operate on two tracks. So right now, the mayor has pre presented to you a budget uh, for your uh, review. And again, the budget that we get through in between now and adoption in 2020 is obviously has to be separated in some part to 2021. So I believe that you have to balance this budget. You can get there uh, with the money that we have. Obviously we want more. 2021 is a whole other fight. And 
we're going to have to use every tool at our disposal in 2021 if we don't have enough federal aid. It's hard to imagine that we wouldn't have federal aid. It would just be unprecedented. Uh, probably would have meant we lost the election and the House. But let's assume that we don't get what we need. Well, all has things have to be on the table. You know, if the state is going to uh, cut services and we are then going to have to ask the wealthiest people to do a little more and step up. There's a lot of ways to pass a budget. It cannot be a budget balanced on the backs of the frontline workers, the heroes, the people who sacrifice their lives. We cannot do that. That is always the default. That's why I have a problem with cutting uh, the, uh, the after school program. Uh, why would we first go after the kids? They had nothing to do with this. And yet we start cutting their futures. That's why I had a problem with the mayor talking about furloughs and layoffs. There's 10 steps between now and 2021. Don't scare the people who are risking their lives. Let's look at agency efficiencies. Let's look at outside contracts. By the way, I will send you, not that I expect you to read it, I wouldn't, um, but I, you know, I've done 418 audits. Um, we've identified close to a billion dollars in potential savings. Let's review those documents. Maybe the audits that we did would be relevant for your budget negotiations. Uh, the, gate, the, the, name, the, the important thing now is we don't want to hurt direct services for the poorest people. We want to keep city workers working. We already have close to uh, 930,000 unemployed people. We don't want to add to that, but we're going to have to be very strategic in budget negotiations both this year, which I think you'll get through, and the next year is the big is the big question. But I'm just I'm a little confused. My understanding is the the budget deficit that we are talking about right now that you identified and that your that your office agrees on is the eight point you know six billion dollars or whatever the exact number is in a, a budget hole. That is what we have to contend with over the next six weeks. We have to we're going to have to pass a budget that closes that hole, not just the sort of two and a half billion dollars of lost revenue in the current fiscal year that we're in, but unless we get that federal money before July 1st, we are gonna have to close an eight and a half billion dollar hole, at least maybe more than that. It could be closer to $10 billion as the IBO is, is projecting uh, in the next six weeks. So that's part of, where I'm asking for your sort of guidance and feedback and help is if that money doesn't come through um, and nope. we have to potentially cut or find eight and a half billion to $10 billion worth of savings over the next six weeks, what areas do you think that we actually should be cutting when we're presented with those difficult decisions to total that amount of money, to total eight and a half billion dollars uh, it's going to require us to make yeah. some painful decisions, and I'd love some uh, feedback on what you think some of those decisions should be. Sure, sure. And um, well, let me assure you: uh, when you review the mayor's budget, you'll find that it covers the 8.7 billion dollar gap. Uh, that's a combination of pegs, federal aid, and the reserves. So that's there. Uh, if we have to go further, you got to look at more efficiencies. You got to look at more. Pegs. There's a lot more fat in that budget. Uh, the council members, you know, the budget dance is going to look a little different than it usually does. And, you know, you're going to have to make some tough decisions on your own. But I can tell you right now, the mayor's spending plan it covers that $8.7 billion. When you review the budget, you'll see that. But there will be more that we have to do if we don't get the federal aid we need. Um, and that's just the reality of the situation. Are there any potential cuts that you would that you think that we should make speci on specific things? How much time do you have? I have time. All right. Well, let's start looking at the money uh, that uh, we spend on outside consultants and a bloated bureaucracy at the DOE, for example. Take a look at our agency watch list uh, that we put out on corrections and DOE and a whole host of city agencies. We have to look at the Thrive Program and say, Look, if it's not producing results, that's got to be a real cut. There's a lot that we can do to get to that budget without hurting vital services. So basically, because we never engaged in a, a PEG program, Mr. Speaker, in seven years, there is a lot of fat in this budget. That, that's the bad news and the good news. Uh, I do believe we can create a real PEG program. I think we really should find efficiencies. You know, I did this in my office. I said, look, 
let's look and, and I, let's look at how much money is in just in the office that we're not utilizing right now. So we gave back millions of dollars to OMB and they asked us for it and we gave it to them. And then I said, well, wait a minute, that's just a one shot. Let's go through a PEG program in our office. Can we give money back without putting more people unemployed, cutting payroll? Because I do believe we don't want to put more people on unemployment line. And you know what? We did it. We have a 4% PEG. And I think we should urge, and I think you should urge as part of the budget negotiation to get agencies when you have your hearings to come up with a spending plan. I think every elected official should do it. I think we'll find, because we weren't pegging over the last seven years, we were spending at a great rate, that maybe that's a way of moving the budget, uh, the budget forward. So as we don't get federal aid, there's a lot of steps. I've mentioned a few of them for you, but obviously I think we can get to a federal aid package that could stave this off. Um, but if not, the mayor has prepared a budget that uh, that is fiscally sound as far as we have analyzed so far. Well, I, I, I look forward to working together. I think that during this uh, really hard time, it's really crucial that all of us work together in, uh, you know, in unity um, to figure out how we can, um, you know, responsibly uh, look out for, as you identified uh, in your remarks, uh, but also in answering some of the questions today, how do we look out for the most vulnerable? How do we look out for the hardest hit communities? How do we continue to lift up our essential workers? Um, and uh, I would uh, welcome the ability to work together uh, in that way and working with your office on things that you all have identified, as you said, through uh, audits that have been done and through other uh, pegs that you've identified that you think that we should be looking at. And one area that I do think would be great for your office and the council to work together would be the Department of Education on the outside consultant contracts, which total hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, for years, uh, you have been saying, and we have been saying that we need to look at those. The proposed cuts that the mayor put forward uh, in his executive budget uh, proposing coupled with the loss of state money for education uh, would see a tremendous loss of dollars for classrooms, uh, for children, for teachers. And we think that there are other ways to identify uh, savings and cuts that will not impact the classroom. That are things that you mentioned, which are uh, DOE outside contracts and consultants um, other things, I think you mentioned, and we've mentioned before, some of the clawback provisions and the bus contracts uh, that exist. Uh, so I think those are some areas that that we could work together on. I will I will just end with this, and then I'll turn it back uh, to to Chair Drum. I know that you an announced, I think it was uh, either last week or the week before that the Bureau of Audits recently sent a letter to First Deputy Mayor Fullahan seeking further information uh, that the city had related to COVID-19 prior to March 22nd's uh, stay at home order that was done by the governor and seeking information related to dissemination of that information to and among uh, New York agencies and officials, essential questions, which I think are important that we ask about who knew what and when did we know it and how did that guide our decision-making process? Uh, I wanted to, to ask, do you see this investigation as a useful tool for decision-makers in the future for future crises? Yes, and um, it's important that we look back and see what government was doing, how we were operating, what the decision-making was. Look, this virus may very well be with us for a very long time. And we owe it to ourselves to take a very serious look at the role of the different agencies, the role of the people at OEM to the people at City Hall. This has to be, uh, this has to be something that we focus on. And you know, as controller, as someone who looks at city agencies, I thought it was appropriate to send the letter that basically says, please hold all the information, hold the emails, hold the uh, decision-making process and make sure that we can have it. Obviously we're in the midst of a pandemic, so we're not going to do anything to upset 
the emergency work at H and H, Department of Health, and the mayor's office. But there will be a reckoning. And look, on a personal level, uh, there are going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of family members who, when the dust is settled, is going to ask, what did the government know? When did they know it? And what did they do about it? I'm one of those family members that wants very much to know. But I also am in government like you. And I think the exercise will be important, not just for the sake of doing it, but we need to build our emergency management system in a way that will be the best in the nation. And we got tripped up here. We did not rise to the occasion. Most of that falls at the Donald Trump level, but we also have to own it here. And I hope to work with the council in providing you with the information so that you can also do your due diligence. And lastly, I just want to say, Mr. Speaker, thank you for giving me this opportunity. This has been my best council hearing in my life. Um, and I want to say that we have an opportunity, even in this tough pandemic and fiscal situation, to just give the relief that so many of our communities need. There are people who are suffering, small businesses and the like in all of our immigrant communities. We have got to create a budget process that fundamentally changes the dynamic. You know, people talk about tale of two cities, but I got to tell you, it is a tale that was told and COVID told it worst of all. They came for the people who are the most vulnerable with pre-existing health conditions. Uh, and it's time for us to now recognize what COVID understood so well, go after the people who we have never invested in. And maybe between the mayor's office, your office, and I'll try to help, we can see better days for our city. And I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Mr. Comptroller. And, and I would, I would uh, welcome the ability for uh, your office and the council to work together uh, in partnership and in coordination through this crisis. I think it's really important that all of us, uh, as we seek to get through this, to work together collaboratively. And so I would welcome and, and ask for the ability that we do that together uh, to band together, as you said, to lift up our city. So I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to be here today. I and, and I would look forward to that type of coordination and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Drum, I turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Controller, in the discussion, the back and forth before, you spoke about uh, further cuts. Uh, where do you see further cuts coming from? Without, if we don't reduce the workforce, where would those cuts come from? Well, let me, let me start by saying, and, and I really appreciate uh, being here again, and I now want to just aff uh, affirm to you, I agree with the speaker uh, that we should work together and partner given this historic pandemic. So I just want to say again, not only thank you to Corey, but thank you to you for giving me this opportunity. Let, let's, let's start looking at what we have said. Uh, I came to you for many years and said that our savings was inadequate and that we needed to be at 12% spend. That never happened through the good times. Well, and we, now- We were very it, close, Mr. Controller. We were at about 10, or almost 11%, if I'm not mistaken. You're, you're at 8.9%, but let me, 8 .9, let me say okay. this. Uh, let, let, let me answer the question, and you can ask me another question. Sure. So that wasn't, that wasn't done. Um, I think we have to get that done now. Because the first question you asked me this year is, where do we cut? And I've been telling people for years that we needed to have a robust PEG program over many years so that we could identify waste in city agencies. And if we had done that, we'd have a billion and a half dollars more today, which would have gone a long way to dealing with some of these crises. So to me, the question is, the first cut is Where not- those cuts? Okay, uh, let me sorry. Let me, I'll try to answer the question as best I can. Um, the, here's where you don't cut. You don't first go after the children and the summer program, because that's just a cut, cut sake. What you really wanna cut are outside 
consulting contracts. You want to look at the waste in every agency. You want to take a look at 418 audits and look at $898 million we've identified as potential revenue sources. And I could take you through some of the big ones. There was, by the way, a great column by Errol Lewis in the Daily News uh, just talking about some of this wasteful spending that should be looked at. Uh, and, and I think we can get there, but it's going to take two things. One, we're really going to have to look at the waste, and we can't balance this budget on the poor people in this city, the children, the elderly, the people with pre-existing health conditions. And I know it's a challenge, but if you really start looking at the waste that we've identified, I think this could be something we could work together on, as the speaker suggested. Do you have suggestions in terms of what contracts to look at? So I would say that, where would I look at? I would look at our agency watch list. I would look at the bloat, uh, as the speaker and I talked about at DOE. I would look at Thrive. I would look at our uh, homeless programs that has ballooned from 1.6 billion at 3.3 billion, yet we have record homelessness. So we really have to engage the Department of Homeless Services and other agencies to actually help have a plan to reduce homelessness because we're throwing a whole lot of money there. I put that agency on our watch list, Department of Corrections on our watch list. The prison population is going way down, but spending keeps going way up. We now spend $333,000 per inmate uh, to, to hold them. That makes no sense economically. So the watch list is one area where I specifically identify waste. And then I can highlight, and I will highlight for you, uh, some of our audits that could have a real direct impact in your budget negotiations. Okay, Mr. Controller, I think we have a couple of questions. Council, committee council? Committee council, yes, do we have questions? If any council member has Yes, we do, Chair. If any council member has questions for the controller, please use the raise hand function. You'll be added to the queue. Council members, please keep your questions to two minutes, including answers. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to tell you when your time begins. The Sergeant will also let you know when your time is up. We will now hear from Council Holden, followed by Council Member Joni. And just before time we go to the questions, now. let me say we're scheduled for public. Before we go to uh, council member questions, let me say we have the public coming in at uh, noon, so we need to uh, move as quickly as possible. Uh, can you give a minute time back, um, Sergeant, to the uh, council members, please? Copy, ready to begin. Council member Holden, you may begin when ready. Um, you hear me? Yes, we do, hear me? Member. Who's this? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Mr. Uh, Control, yes, welcome to the virtual chambers. You hear me? Okay. Uh, Who's nice this? to see you again. Uh, I have three questions. First of all, uh, I applaud you. I applaud oh, you Mr. Holden, how are you? you? Um, drive. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I applaud you, uh, Mr. Controller, on your oversight of Thrive and holding the mayor's feet to the fire. Uh, why not hold up uh, all Thrive contracts, first of all? Uh, and I have an, uh, just a couple of questions and I want to throw in there. Uh, do you believe, like some people in the city, on cutting the NYPD? And my final question is, the city has invested billions of dollars in the congregate homeless shelter model, which I thought never worked. They are inhumane and many are dangerous. Now in the new pandemic world that we live in, they've been exposed. Uh, seeing this, will you consider not approving contracts for congregate style homeless shelters? Thanks a lot. Uh, no, I would not. Um, but let me, start at, let me start at the beginning with you. Um, we don't, we can't stop contract under the city charter unless we find 
tremendous evidence of waste or fraud or some very serious legal issues. Um, a lot of the times we send back contractors because the mayor's office of contracts and the agencies can't fill out basic or answer basic questions. So we don't approve it right away. We send them back. But at the end of the day, uh, the mayor and the mayor does register contracts uh, when he's had enough of our questions. So that is not a strategy, as you know, uh, that works. It just goes against, uh, you know, it goes against the city charter. And I know in the council, you know, you like to stretch these things, but I have to be mindful of the laws that I operate under. Time expired. Well, I, I just thought so answering the other two questions on the um, on the NYPD. You may continue, uh, Councilmember Holden. Yes, uh, on on uh, on the NYPD, on cutting the NYPD. Do you think, like some people in the city, that we should cut the NYPD in these pandemic times? Again, we don't know what what we're going to face. Look, we want to make sure that every agency operates at the most efficient level. And the NYPD is no exception for looking at ways to find efficiencies to make sure that money can be used to deal with the budget crisis, to deal with struggling communities. And I don't think the, I think the NYPD, it would be useful to go through a peg exercise there as well. Uh, and on the congregate shelters, we, we can't use some of them now. Uh, many of them, they're putting uh, the, um, obviously the homeless individuals in, in, home, in, um, in hotels. And the problem we're seeing here now, we're, we're throwing billions into this model. And by the way, I, I visited uh, a shelter and it resembles a jail. So it's inhumane. So I think if we look at a different model going forward in, in the pandemic, that it can actually uh, maybe force us to give uh, uh, more, more options on affordable homes or at least uh, rooms where uh, these, these individuals can actually feel like they reside somewhere. Well, well, Councilman, you, you may recall, we've talked about this, that you know my office did the original investigations of the terrible conditions within the homeless system uh, and basically forced the state and the city to make repairs in my earliest years in office. Uh, I visited the shelters. I've seen the terrible conditions human beings are placed in. Uh, for the only crime of just being poor or not having a home. And we have to do more to make sure that homeless people are treated with dignity. But we also have to have a housing plan that is much different than the one we have today. I've talked about it at council hearings. We're building housing uh, for everybody but the poorest people who need a home. That has to change. And that has to be part of making sure that permanent, real affordable housing, yes, let's say low income housing, will go a long way to reducing homeless shelters. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Let's go to our next council member. We will now hear, by, hear from council member Joe Nye, followed by council member Rosenthal. Thank you, Hi. Uh, um, uh, Scott, this is the first time that I've interacted with you since this pandemic broke. Um, I want to just extend my sincerest condolences to you and your family on the loss of your mother. Thank um, you very, very much. Very, very painful. Uh, let me get to the gist of it. There's a lot, not so much time. How would you rate the health of the city's finances today on a scale of one to 10 and the 10 being the healthiest? And that's quickly so we can do a shooting gallery. I, 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 would, I would say we're at a zero. When you shut down an entire uh, uh, economy uh, because of a pandemic, we're clearly at that ground zero mark. But I do think, but I do think we have a way forward uh, we have a, a, a budget that will be balanced and long term, we're going to have to really think about turning on and getting that revenue back. We lost seven billion dollars in revenue in the span of two months. And uh, that's something that makes it serious to me. Thank, thank you. I have a lot of questions to ask you. Um, and I agree with you. And I was I was pushing you even harder than the 12 percent on reserves, if you recall. And it's yes. startling for me to understand that when this administration took over the budget in 2014, it was at $70 billion. Since then, under this administration, under our watch, including yourself, the budget has increased by 33%. 
and yet we still have pain and suffering out there. So 12% was never enough to begin with based on our reckless spending. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, the pet cuts that you refer to often enough, and I just want to piggyback on a question from Councilman Holden. Um, the question is, when it comes to the NYPD, do you agree with the mayor's position not to, to allow the graduating class um, to commence and suspend the NYPD incoming class? Are we jeopardizing our safety uh, and increasing crime rates because of the attrition, retirement of our officers? I think, well, let me, let me just say, the question that you raised about the 12%, uh, you know, when this administration took over, we actually had at one point a savings of 18%. So I think the lesson is that savings really comes in handy when you're in the middle of a pandemic. And, and that is lesson number one. Lesson number two though, look, I put up 4% in my office. I want you to match me, you know, right. let, let, let's put our money where our mouth is. You know, everyone talks about cutting and you know, this and that, we got to do something. So I call on the members of council, my friends, let's do the 4%, let's lead by example and let's go to every city agency and say to them, we did it without laying off people. You can do it too. Comptroller, because we have lack of time. What about the NYPD? Uh, if, do you agree with the mayor's suspension of the uh, upcoming class as uh, a good support? Do you support it or not? Because I'm worried about crime rates and I'm worried about the safety that we're jeopardizing. When look, you yourself know there's yeah. plenty of fat that we can cut. Look, I think that the mayor and the police commissioner uh, are going to make decisions balancing the need to save money with the needs to keep the city safe. Uh, I do think, for example, that even in tough economic times, uh, police should have a specific role. Uh, and we shouldn't be social distancing with police officers. We should be social. We should be social distancing with volunteers and ambassadors and community-based organizations. That's where we should be putting it, not putting the cops in a situation that's untenable. And then, when you do the analysis, you find out, no surprise, that communities of color have been basically the ones getting in trouble for not wearing masks and allegedly not wearing masks and social distancing. So there's ways to prioritize security in the city. And I, I only have a minute left, left, Controller. I'm sorry. I want you to answer these questions, but I only have a minute left. Have you evaluated the impact that it would have if we didn't allow this graduating class? I didn't. Uh, I haven't. Uh, done, I haven't done that analysis. If you'd like okay. me to, I, Please, I would love to see that because I'm really afraid of the future and what it means. In 2018, we began a project together. If you recall, reviewing the city-owned properties and the lease agreements with private renters, private landlords. I still believe the office space that we currently own as a city and occupy is not occupied to its potential. Why are we leasing property when our own office space is not fully occupied and there's vacancies? That would be a good start. This is something that we started talking about in February of 2018. I think we're going to find a lot of savings there uh, as we move forward. And my last question to you, um, and I hope that you're going to give me a commitment that, yes, you'll do that with me and continue looking for that savings. So I think you're 100% right about that. We should not be, and I've called out the city agencies, DCAS and the like. Time expired. Our deals. And my last question to you, Comptroller, please answer this one. You can refer to small business contributing to fed the federal government at $22 billion. Our small businesses contribute to New York City. And right now, New York City is not doing right by our small businesses. It was a joke that the city allocated $49 million in total for loans and grants to over 230,000 small businesses. What is the dollar amount that our small businesses contribute to the city's coffers at, to get back such a fraction? We have got to rethink our small business planning. Uh, obviously, we don't have enough time to do it specifically, but I agree with you. The help that they need is not forthcoming. You know, I look at women and minority owned businesses, for example, the city spends 20 billion, $23 billion on procurement, hiring law firm, accounting firms, hiring food vendors, council member, only 4.9% of those dollars go to women and minority owned businesses in so many of our communities, like in the Bronx and other places. So that has to change. We need to make a level playing field so people can contribute to city for city dollars. This is something we can do. We don't need the federal government to do it. Uh, I believe it's very critical. I do a 
webinar for MWBs every week. We've had 1,500 businesses coming, federal, questions about the feds, the state and the city. There's so much that we have to do for our small businesses. Scott, a recent report said 25% of our small businesses, all small businesses will not reopen. 75% of restaurants and bars will never reopen. That is a disaster for our future and our economy. We need to do more, and I'm looking forward to doing it with you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just follow up on that. Commissioner, D, uh, Commissioner, Controller, do you support the Small Business Survival Act? Oh, I've said everything has to be on the table, including that. They're not, the question is not whether I support it, whether you support it, and you're going to pass it. Well, we, I just wanted to know whether, what, your, what your feelings are on that. Look, I think that we have to take a real hard look at commercial space and commercial dollars. I'm going to refer you to a report I did on the whole issue of vacant storefronts, and it is a dire situation. One of the things that as a kid growing up in the 70s, we liked about storefronts is it created a sense of streetscape and people energy and the lights on and the 24 hour city. And between what we had to do to shut down small businesses and now what we're facing, uh, we need to have everything on the table about how we're gonna repopulate our commercial space, how we're gonna do it. Obviously it's bigger than any one piece of legislation now. It's literally how we're gonna reimagine the entire city. So I would say to you, we should have a conversation about what is a small business gonna look like? I would argue that small business is no longer just the actual physical space in the store. The bars and restaurants have gotta come out to the street, which means we have to reimagine our streets, not just for bike lanes and bus lanes, but now how can we integrate busways, for example, and integrate an economy with that? There's a lot of opportunity here to look at the city totally differently that, and that will mean different pieces of legislation and different ways we approach it. Okay, thank you, Mr. Controller. I think we have a couple more questions. Uh, committee Council? Yes, we will now hear from Council Member Rosenthal followed by Council Member Yeager. Thanks, begin. Thanks so much, uh, Chair Drum. Uh, Mr. Controller, I too haven't seen you. Uh, to let you know my deepest condolences about your mom. I know how big a loss that was. Um, really, really deep condolences. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I listened very intently to your uh, testimony. I've read your testimony, so there's no need to sort of go through that again. And of course, I'm on a clock. Uh, and I've heard your responses over the last few minutes as well. So it sounds like uh, the size of the city's revenue shortfall between the two years is inching toward $10 billion, um, roughly 10% of the city's budget, um, a little bit more than that. And um, you laid out uh, exactly what I'm hearing in the budget negotiating team you laid out the city's response the uh, same way that we understand it. Um, I'm wondering, and fundamentally what I want to get to is, what would your response to a $10 billion shortfall look like? And you and I know each other, we're both West Siders. Um, it, you know I'm all about the details. Um, yes, you are. So I am wondering um, if you could, you don't have to do it now, but you mentioned uh, that you have ideas through your audits of about a uh, billion dollars. It sounds like it's some combination of revenue increases and expense decreases. Do, could you send them, a, it, it is true I am not going to have the time to read 418 audits and call out which are the most realistic. So Council what I'm I th hoping I thought is that you would send over a list in priority order with the top one being not the highest dollar one, but the most realistic. So could you create a list like that where you're, you know, sort of lowest hanging fruit first? 
and on downwards because yes, we're gonna need more savings. And yes, all of us wanna go after those DOE contracts. My goodness, in my second year, I was able to help save $600 million because of a corrupt contract. We could sure, you know, look into all those now. So firstly, just set this out of the way. You can send over the priority list. So let me let me say this. So let just cutting to the chase. The answer is I would be happy to. Uh, Great, because let me tell you one of my concerns. You mentioned Thrive, for example. So Thrive has already been cut down to its bones in its most recent iteration by the mayor. And what's left is things that had been there all the time, like the contract the NYPD has with Safe Horizon for the CVAP program. And I, for one, would not want to see that cut or that to be on the table. So that's why I'm asking for the specifics. I'm sure your cut to thrive accommodates that, but that's why I'm asking for the specifics. The second thing is that was so interesting to me is you mentioned um, tax opportunities, raising revenues in that way. And I guess I'm very excited about that. Um, first, I'm wondering, do you know of any opportunities that the city could do without state approval? And then if there are those, boy, I'm really interested. But then for the ones that require state approval, um, and, and you should know, I had a, a piece come out in the nation, uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before, where I articulate two uh, tax ideas that the state could pass that could raise us, uh, frankly, enough money to get us out of this revenue sort of short-term revenue shortfall, which we could then unwind that tax once we get out of this short-term problem in the scheme of things. What are your specific- Time expired. Thank you. Please let me know. And if you can't articulate it right now, again, if you could send over a list of your top priority tax revenue ideas and how much money you think they will yield. So let me, so let me, I, I will send you documentation, but let me just give you sort of my view. First is feds, feds, feds. We need a stimulus. No, I understand that. And right now, no. Donald Trump is president well, and we have a reality. Of so, course, feds, so, feds, feds, we all need but, but that. That's, all, but that, that's, but, an, that's an obvious. We set right. that aside already. I had to say it, feds, feds, feds. Next, next. Pegs, pegs, pegs. Because and you have about a billion and we have a $10 billion, that, billion dollar we shortfall. Billion. We could do a little more without harming essential services and harming- Okay, workers. two billion. Now we have well, eight billion more. Me, I'll do it. Then we have to look at revenues. Now, most of the real revenues are state options, but look, depending on where this goes, uh, we're gonna need everyone to step up. So just like our nurses and our grocery delivery workers and everybody who's on the trains giving their, risking their lives, our teachers. We have some people who have just fought every day for the city and we applaud no, them. No, I understand. So do you have a so specific let me, let me, let me revenue tax idea? Yeah, let me answer the question because then you'll know what I'm saying. So that is one group of people who stepped up. I've said that people who have done well economically, the wealthiest people also have to step up if we need their help and their tax dollars to close the budget deficit. In this so state. one of the specific so, ideas that I laid on. out. Councilman, we're gonna have to move on. Okay, well, I look forward to seeing your list, um, controller, and how much money you think each of the tax ideas is worth. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you, you Councilmember. Uh, the next council member, please. We will now hear from Council Member Yeager, followed by Council Member Machaca. Time begins now. Good afternoon, Mr. Controller. It's good to see you. I hope you're doing well. Thank you. Um, you too. Uh, I, have a, I have just a few questions in just a few minutes. I'm going to try to run through them as quickly as possible. First of all, I assume all of your audits to be realistic. 
Um, don't have to order them up for me. As far as I'm concerned, uh, implement every single one of them is fine by me. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. I, I don't believe you to be the kind of uh, imprudent fiscal conservative that uh, that makes irresponsible suggestions. So those audits ought to be implemented, and I think there are real savings there. Uh, and keep sending them our way because they're, you know, some of us do actually read them. Uh, and I know one came in uh, just a few days ago and found it interesting as well. We'll talk about that at a different time. Uh, I, I'd also like to urge you along the lines of uh, what uh, Mr. Joe and I, Councilman Joe and I, indicated. Um, uh, in, you know, in our first uh, two or three months of the session of this council, uh, a number of us identified a city agency that was about to do a, a lease deal that was so outrageous, um, uh, they, they were able to build themselves a movie studio, in fact, double their space. And, um, and we identified it, asked a couple of questions, and DCAS pulled it back uh, simply because they took another look. I think that you're in a position, a unique position, to take a look at leases that are on their way to expiring or close thereto, and to start indicating to the city whether or not the city needs to really look hard about not renewing those because I think that the city kind of just sometimes operates on autopilot and we're there, we're just gonna say, let's keep on going. So I think that's something that you can do and I think you can identify real savings. Um, on interest, uh, I, I will just say that for the last two years, my, two, my first two years in the council, I voted no on the interest rates. I always thought 18% was usurious, uh, punitive, abusive in many ways. Um, and in the last uh, uh, vote that we took, uh, 12 members, of the council voted no on the 7%, seven members of the council voted no on the 18%. Um, I, the three and a quarter and the five, I still think are too high. And I would urge that we look at uh, doing an interest rate, first of all, that looks backwards and, and waives the April interest rate for those who could not pay, waives July, completely waives zero, and then moving forward for the rest of the fiscal year, that's an interest rate that is not greater than what one can get for keeping the money in the bank. We don't want people to take an interest-free loan on the back of the city, but at the same time, I think it's unrealistic to assume that people are not paying their taxes because they just don't feel like it. I think we know what people are going through, and I would just urge you as a member of the commission to just keep your eye open. I am a guaranteed no vote when that bill comes up, when that reso comes up in front of the council, but uh, that's something to look forward to. I'm, I'm going to keep on rolling through this, and then you can answer afterwards because my clock is ticking and the clock is, uh, the bell is unforgiving. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, I think Councilman Joe and I uh, met, asked you to take a look at the police academy um, uh, numbers. I, I do believe, uh, I, I've said publicly, I think that the class should remain. Um, my reason is because I think that the attrition numbers, as we see police attrit, you know, it's just irresponsible to say that in two years, we're not gonna need to have this class ready and ready to go and I think we have to do it by starting the class now. I would urge you to just take a look at the attrit numbers at moving forward, your estimates of what you think that's going to be, um, COVID retirements, things like that, that would reduce the level of policing to a place where it becomes just unsafe. And I think you're, again, in a unique position to do that. Last, uh, you mentioned 4% of elected, uh, in terms of what elected officials ought to be doing. I would like to flag this for you. I'm gonna do it in an open place. For the last two years, uh, for the last three years, my three years of, of voting on this topic, I have voted no on the council's operating budget. The council's operating budget is uh, currently, with the uh, uh, budget that we've uh, proposed with my no vote, 40% uh, more than just two years ago. It was in fiscal year 18 proposed to be 64 million. We came in, we overspent it by a million. We then immediately raised it to 80. 1 million in our first year. We overspent that by, by 1.1 million because we can't seem to spend within the budget that we adopt. The next year, FY20, we raised it again by 7.7%, uh, by another 6.2 million. We overspent that by 2 million. And now we are $26 million proposed to spend more than the last council spent walking out the door. That's 40%. We can do better than 4%. I and another, a number of other members return money every year from our operating budgets, but it doesn't go back to the taxpayers. It goes into the council's budget to spend on whatever, you know, I don't know, whatever they spend it on. Controller, please look at it, okay? That's what you gotta do. You gotta Time expired. Don't be shy. What, what we're doing what, wrong. Don't what, be shy. You're not shy. All right, well, I've never been accused of being shy, but 
Uh, thank you for laying out your agenda. I'll try to get to you know some of it, but one, I appreciate complimenting the people in our office who do the audits. They do a great job and thank you for recognizing that. And by the way, thank you for reading the audits throughout the year, not just at budget time. So I believe you probably sit up at night and you probably read a lot around here. So it gives me something to do. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, look, the police class is delayed till July. I will crunch some attrition numbers, but it's only delayed till July. Again, in all fairness to the mayor, you know, you, you have to make decisions and, you know, I can't as control and micromanage everything. Sometimes I try, but I, I don't really want to do that. So, but I hear what you're saying in terms of your budget review. Uh, in terms of uh, the Department of Finance issues, I think we can, I think you raised an interesting idea. Why don't we work together with DOF uh, to make sure we bring relief um, you know, the 18% the, the piece is such a small part of the biggest commercial properties, but I could, we could zero that too. We could come up with a plan for that. Uh, I do want to say that the mayor did make a big move in reducing. And so we all continue to make that a work in progress. And you know how government works. You do one thing and then people say, do more. And I, one of those people, let's do more. Uh, and lastly, in terms of the 4% idea, uh, I think the 4% will really help with the budget because you return money, but you didn't return an employee. And when you have big budgets like the controller's office and the council and the mayor's office, it's a great way to lead by example. And it's a great way for individual elected officials. And if we all stood up and did it, then it gives us the ability to bring in the agencies and say, why are you having this contract that you never moved on, but meanwhile, you got millions of dollars sitting there? Well, maybe you don't need that contract. And so I think uh, today, if we could start uh, a pledge of elected officials, you know, we, you know, who will be willing to, you know, do, I did my 4%, let's start something here. Let's all do it together. And, and, and everybody calls OMB and say, we're in. And maybe that'll get the agencies that have been a little shy about this, to step up. And again, we're not saying cut essential services or people, we're not. We're simply saying there's a lot of inefficiencies in the budget. We've never done a PEG program for seven years. It's, it, it's sitting there waiting to be plucked. Thank you, Mr. Controller. Thank you. All right, next question, please. We will now hear from Councilmember Menchaca followed by Majority Leader Cumbo. Time begins now. Controller uh, Stringer, uh, buenas tardes, and uh, again, my deep condolences to you and your family. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. I want to concentrate on two areas, and I know we've been uh, talking a little bit about it, which is the NYPD budget and the significant cuts that our communities are asking for. It's not just a fiscal prudent moment and action, it's also what our communities are asking us to do. And as representatives of those communities, the council has the power to, to actually make that happen with or without the commissioner or the mayor. Uh, so when the council does it and we reduce the NYPD budget, will you join us in a virtual rally uh, that really kind of sees a reduction and celebrates the saving of SYAP and all the essential services? Let's see how far you get before committing to uh, uh, joining you, you know, at these uh, victory press conferences. I actually don't like them because when you announce something and there's no follow through, uh, we give people a false sense of victory. But I will work with you to make sure that uh, we actually get some things done in this budget cycle. Okay, that's fair enough. Uh, you know what I'm saying? It's yeah, you know, I, and I, I'm talking about post. I'm talking about yeah. the very near future. I want to see how you, I'm here at some point. You know, I leave, my, I leave my analysis and then it's up to you folks to hit it out of the park for the sake of our city. So if you do it, I'll, you know, maybe I'll even be invited. I haven't spoken so much in this finance committee hearing. I feel like a member of the council today. Maybe yeah. I'll be invited to the ha budget handshake. This is Love it. All, of that. All of that is good. Uh, next thing is there's some folks that have been floating this concept of borrowing money. And I'm not sure if that's been fully uh, fleshed out in this conversation. Uh, Helen Rosenthal yesterday in a, in a press conference really kind of spoke to this concept that we can that we can do that to really move us through this um, 
possible austerity budget, which nobody wants and needs for the future of the city. Uh, have you studied that and uh, so would support the kind of move for OMB to begin to borrow money as we wait for the Fed, Fed, Fed money to come? So it's nice to know that we have the ability to borrow if we need it. Strategically and strategy, if you think back to how we looked at a number of these fiscal issues that we had after 9-11, where we did borrow a limited amount of money, uh, the Great Recession 2008, there was always a combination package that went forward. So borrowing is good uh, if you don't have to pay the debt later, right? So I'm gonna represent my kids and all the children of New York City who are doing remote learning. You don't wanna put a dollar amount that they're gonna have to pay because we couldn't get our job done. So part of what we have to do is make tough choices. Then we have to get federal money. Uh, then we have to do all the things that I suggested. There are other people of good suggestions, but look, just like raising revenue, borrowing is an option down the line. But strategically, let's get to where we have to be because it's not free money. It's not stimulus money. We're going to have to pay it back. And the debt service on the 9-11 money is money we're still paying. Like, and the money that we borrow now, our kids will pay. But again, smart budgeting is not about any one thing. It's about a total package. And then, and look, I'm in the controller business. So I have to imagine not just 20 and 21, but we have to look at that borrowing over the next 10 years. There's gonna be union contracts and labor issues and, and, and hiring issues. And borrowing means less money for essential services if we do it the wrong way and we do it the fast way. So I have a lot of respect for, uh, you know, for Helen's ideas, but when you really put together an economic package, it's a lot harder, and that's what we should all be focusing on. But look, it's, everything's on the table as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Comptroller. We will now hear from Majority Leader Cumbo, followed by Council Member Levin. Time begins now. Thank you so much, Comptroller. Uh, I also want to share with my colleagues in terms of expressing my condolences to you and your family, um, especially your boys, because I know how much little boys love their grandma. And so I know this is very hard for them. Um, I wanted to uh, follow up on some of the comments and statements that uh, many of the elected officials prior to me had stated in terms of the police department. I don't think, uh, Many members of the city council believe that we don't need uh, additional police, particularly during this time. But I think that the challenge that we face is that the police department as it currently graduates as class are gonna continuously have the same issues in terms of much of the brutality that we've already seen. And so the police department hasn't shown any real um, way or strategy that they've changed their training that they've implemented officers into communities that they're unfamiliar with, that there are any uh, checks and balances in terms of officers who uh, betray the trust of the community. And so these are issues that are still really important to us. And I don't think that it's prudent to then send an additional class into the community in a way that's going to create the level of unrest that we saw with the Eric Garner situation that created such unrest in the city of New York with people shutting down bridges, shutting down tunnels, protesting, and these sorts of things, which I believe if we do not uh, put those precautions into place and that checks and balances, we're gonna continue to see a level of unrest that we've never seen in the city of New York that's gonna defeat the very purposes of bringing in an additional NYPD class. So I just wanted to put that out there um, to begin. And then with the growth of the city council in terms of its budget, when we first came into office, one of the challenges that we saw was that our staff were paid significantly less than almost any other city agency. And it created a phenomenon where many staff members left the city council to go to other agencies, um, particularly the mayor's side. And because the pay 
was much greater on the mayor side than it was on the council side. So in addition to that, let's say an office in Fort Greene, Brooklyn, a council office is way more money than let's say in Brooklyn, in uh, East New York or Greenpoint or other areas, the rent is very high. So each office has the ability to spend money differently based off of where they're located. So the city council's budget in terms of how we spend money is also very important. I also wanna bring attention to the summer youth employment program. I know many people have spoken about that. Can you speak to us a bit in terms of what are your solutions or how do you see um, the city of New York moving forward with the summer youth employment program and how can we uh, save our youth this summer um, through this process? So let me, let me just address a couple issues. Um, you are 100% right about the over-policing in this city. You know, I was one of the first people who looked like me to say, uh, you know, stop and frisk was unacceptable. And I have done a lot of research and reports standing with community-based organizations to make sure that we don't target people of color in certain neighborhoods in policing. And I say that to you because once again, uh, we see another form of stop and frisk, and that is now called social distancing. Uh, when communities of color are the ones getting arrested and people who look like me in different neighborhoods are not getting arrested at the same proportion. That's outrageous. That's unacceptable. It should never have happened. We need to create an ambassador program. We need to engage not-for-profits and community-based organizations in social distancing. And we've got to make sure that this budget doesn't attack the very people who are struggling. The children, like ours, uh, you know, Lori, who are really going through a lot of difficult times. Uh, you know, I celebrated Miles' seventh birthday yesterday, mm -hmm. and what a different way of doing that, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things I want to make it clear is that, look, we have to be mindful of the budget, and we can't overspend, and we have fiscal issues. But don't take it out on the young people who need those summer jobs. Don't take it out on them. Uh, they deserve better. To turn around and say that was the pro first program you were going to throw under the bus, that was offensive mm -hmm. to me. The second thing that was offensive is like, well, we're going to threaten city workers who are riding the trains. and Time expired. And so I think there's a lot that we can do there. Okay. Um... I had more to say, but um, I will hold for the next time. Thank you so much for your uh, questions and answers, and I appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. Let's go to our, I believe, our last question. Yes. We will now hear from Council Member Levin. Time begins now. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, Controller, um, my, my condolences to you as well on Who's the lawsuit. It's Who's us. <laughs> this is Albert. Oh my God. Hello, Albert. You got a good dad. Thanks. Uh, uh, he, li he likes the screens. We're trying to, uh, uh, <laughs> to limit that as much as possible. So, uh, I just wanted to ask, you know, I'm, I'm on the, um, I'm on the budget um, negotiating team and, um, you know, we are, we are facing um, uh, a budget negotiation right now that um, you know is kind of beyond comprehension for a lot of us. Um, me, who I've been, this is my eleventh budget at the council, and um, I was even in in 2010, 2011, we had to make cuts, but not not uh, eleven percent of our budget, um, and what I mean how do you approach uh, or how would you approach um, that magnitude of cuts because I, I, I was listening to um, your uh, uh, discussion with Councilor Rosenthal and you know while yeah we, we, we would greatly appreciate um, you know the the digest version of the audit that the controller's office has done to, to achieve savings um you know we've never seen anything like this and it's just how do we responsibly get to a level of cuts like 10 billion dollars and 
you know, I, I hear you about the feds. I don't have a direct line to Mitch McConnell. I heard on, on the news that they were unlikely to pass anything by July 4th. Well, we have to pass our budget before July 4th. So, um, you know, I don't see the cavalry coming to rescue us there. Um, and, and so what do we do? I mean, what, what, do you, what do you recommend as the controller of the city of New York? Uh, well, I think now you're about to earn your money. This is why you get paid the big bucks because every once in a generation, uh, we are called to make tough decisions. Uh, there was a generation, my mother was one of them in the city council back in the 1970s when the city was on the edge of bankruptcy. We had to deal with issues like this after Hurricane Sandy. We had to deal with issues after the Great Recession in 2008. We have unfortunately seen this many times before economically. Now I'm the first to say we've never seen anything like this, but we are going to have to create a budget that at the same time protects the short-term fiscal health of the city and create a long-term agenda for reimagining the city, reimagining the economy, getting revenue. So right, but, but, but about, the control, we need to, you know, let me say, we need to okay. think of revenue raisers if all else fails. We need to look at the people who've made billions in this town, and we may have to ask them to pay a little more. Uh, we've done that before in the past, but we really have to come up with a comprehensive package, Steve. There's no one magic bullet, and it's not going to get any easier for no, you. I, it's just unfortunately. No, I know. I'm just, but we have a, but our situation over the next several weeks is that we have to have a budget with the, uh, with the mayor, un, unrelated to uh, any actions by the state. I don't think the state is going to give us a millionaire's tax. I don't think the feds are going to give us a, a stimulus, uh, at least not by, by, by uh, the time we have to negotiate this. And it's, we're just, we're facing, we are under the gun here to the point where, um, you know, we are, we have, we're, we're, we're looking at, at, at a potential austerity budget. Are there, what are some short-term things that you might recommend us doing to forestall austerity measures? Well, I don't know what you mean by austerity measures. You have- Massive cuts, massive, massive <laughs> cuts to social services, to, to, but, to, to education, to police but, and fire, to, well, we, I mean, 10% is it, beyond, there's not, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no level of efficiencies that, that account for 10% or 11% of our budget. So we, I mean, that's what we're looking at. I, you know, I want to be, be clear. Um, well, look, I what, think- What are some short-term measures? I maybe think that, 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 could, that bridge. I think you should get in and grill every agency- Time expired. On, on those, I think you should grill every agency on those efficiencies and look at big ticket items that have not provided results and make sure that you are not divesting from the community's hardest hit COVID. And I hope that my testimony and answering questions has given you some sense of where I think we should go with this. I know you have big challenges, but I do believe that the people I know on this council, uh, from the speaker to the finance chair, to the majority leader, to you and your role, uh, that we'll work together and get there. And if you want to talk to me or anyone wants to talk offline about is there, some of our recommendations and questions, I'd be happy to help you as is there, well. Is, is there anything short term? Is there any short term? Council, short -term council, member, council member, we're okay. going to need to move along. We're 40 minutes behind okay. in our public testimony. I want to okay. thank the controller for coming. I appreciate you giving your answers, and uh, we will be. Uh, working with you as we move toward adoption of the budget. Thank, Thank you. you for all giving me this opportunity. This has, been, uh, this has been very helpful to me as well. And I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Drum. You always do a great job at these hearings. Thank you. Thank you. You're very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right now, uh, this will conclude uh, this portion of today's hearing. Thank you, Controller Stringer, for being here. Uh, we'll take like a five minute break, no more, and then we're gonna gavel right back in and then have public testimony. We have a very, very, very long list of people who wanna testify. So, um, you know, we wanna accommodate everyone. 
and uh, we will be back shortly to do that. So five minutes and then we will start with the um, public portion.
or members of the public, if you could please refrain from using the raise hand function. Once again, members of the public, please refrain from using the raise hand function. You will be called on in panel order. Thank you. Once again, for those just joining us, we ask you to please refrain from using the raise hand function. Once again, please refrain from using the raise hand function on Zoom. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I ask that you all please turn your devices to vibrate. Please mute your microphones on Zoom if they are unmuted. Please ensure that you have named yourself correctly in Zoom. If you are unable to rename yourself, we will contact you. Please ensure that you have named, uh, if you do not rename yourself or you cannot rename yourself, the host or someone will help you do that. We will begin the meeting on the Committee of Finance jointly with capital budget, public testimony. Chairs, whenever you're ready. Good afternoon and welcome to the city council's sixth and final day of hearings on the mayor's executive budget for fiscal 2021. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the finance committee. We are joined by speaker Corey Johnson and by the subcommittee on capital budget chaired by my colleague, council member Vanessa Gibson we will now hear from the public. I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us, and they are Council Members Adams, Amphrey Samuel, Grudenchik, Menchaca, Ayala, Yeager, Kostowitz, Cumbo, Chin, Jonai, and Holden. Uh, before I turn it over to Speaker Johnson, I just want to say thank you to all the members of the public who are taking time out of their schedules to testify on the fiscal 2021 executive budget. We value what each of you has to say, particularly as we collectively try to grapple with what is happening in our city. Please know that even if we don't directly respond to your testimony at today's hearings, we hear you and your testimony is making a difference. 
we have 336 people registered to testify today. So it is only in the interest of time that we cannot respond individually. As a reminder, each of you will have two minutes to deliver your testimony, and we, we request out of respect of the hundreds of other people who are waiting to speak that you please stay within your allotted time. At the end of your panel's testimony, you will, re, you, you will be removed from the Zoom meeting and you may continue to watch the hearing via live, via live stream for the duration of the meeting at www.council.nyc.gov slash live stream. Uh, and just before I turn this over to Speaker Johnson, I just wanna thank him for um, the amazing job he has done uh, to ensure that government can proceed um, as best as we can uh, using these uh, remote hearings. While many legislatures and government um, organizations have not been able to operate, Council Speaker Corey Johnson has stepped up to the plate with the help of all of our staff and enabled us to have these um, budget hearings so that the public can remain informed and participate. And I really just wanna say it's a, a, t a tribute to uh, what Speaker Johnson has done. So Mr. Speaker, thank you very, very much for all of your hard work. You did. Uh, th there we go. Can people hear me? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Danny. Thank you for doing a great job uh, chairing these hearings from your home. Uh, we've all got to uh, see a lot of you and you've done a remarkable job under difficult circumstances Then your community and your district has been one of the hardest hit from COVID-19 and even in the midst of that you have been ably and smartly and compassionately chairing these finance committee hearings day after day after day and I am just unbelievably grateful for the work you do for your district, but the work you have done the last two and a half years as chair of the city council's finance committee. You know, in the last two budgets, you and I with the rest of our colleagues were able to work on investing in programs that really helped and served the most vulnerable, everything from fair fares uh, to help New Yorkers who are living in poverty be able to get on the subway at half price so they couldn't be locked out of participating in our city to uh, investing in the city's social safety net, helping immigrants and children and teachers and senior citizens and LGBT people and communities of color and immigrant rich communities. We have done that work together. But as you have talked about and as I have talked about over the course of the last many weeks, this budget is very, very different. Tragically and sadly, this budget is gonna be like, unlike any budget that we have ever had to deal with before because of the significant, tremendous loss of revenue that the city is projecting from COVID-19 and our economy being shut down, which means that we are gonna to have to make choices that we would never ever contemplate uh, during normal times. I'm really proud that over the last uh, two years, as you being finance chair, and my being speaker, we have pushed the administration to set aside uh, nearly $500 million in additional reserves when not many people were talking about reserves and a lot of people just wanted us to spend that money. We actually were pushing for reserves because we knew a rainy day would come and those reserves are gonna help us in some ways in this year's budget. We also, just to highlight, uh, and I wanna thank the finance committee uh, staff and the finance division staff led by Latanya McKinney, we every year have been identifying additional cuts for the administration, additional savings even outside of a PEG program for the administration so that we could find those savings year after year. And the council has done that and you have been a big part of that. Before we get to the public, uh, all of their testimony is valuable and important. I just wanna say something that I think you have been saying consistently throughout these hearings, which is uh, we're gonna have to make cuts. And unless that money comes from Washington very quickly, uh, I hope that the members of the public who are watching and listening today uh, understand just the dire situation that we're in, at least an eight and a half billion dollar hole 
maybe more than that. It could be $10 billion is what the independent budget office identified. So I know there are going to be a lot of folks who testify in us wanting to increase dollar amounts or double the amount of an existing program. That's just not the reality of where we are right now as a city. So uh, we need that money from Washington. And the one action item that I would give members of the public who are watching and who want to testify today is to call the members of the New York congressional delegation and thank them. Thank them for fighting for us and thank them for continuing to fight against Mitch McConnell and the Trump White House, who is really putting the screws to New York right now, New York City and New York State. The state can't help us. They're facing a 13 to $17 billion budget deficit. They're probably going to have to take more money away from us because of that. The city has the deficit that I mentioned. The only way to not have what members have talked about is this horrible budget is to get that money from Washington. So, so much of this is a moving target. Until we know when our economy is going to reopen, until we know how much money we're getting from Washington and when that will happen, that affects this entire budget. So I want to thank the public. I think the last uh, seven years of my being a council member, uh, when uh, Chair Ferreris Copeland was chair of the Finance Committee, and now of you being chair of the Finance Committee, I have uh, participated in these public sessions, listening to the public to understand what their needs are. And I want to thank you for chairing this today. You've done a great job, Danny, throughout this entire process. I'm incredibly proud of you. I'm proud of your work as a council member. I'm proud of uh, you being a great friend and the values that you hold for our city. You've done a remarkable and wonderful job and the city of New York should be proud of you as well. So I will turn it back to you so that we can begin this public testimony. And again, I wanna thank my staff and I wanna thank the staff of the Finance Committee led by Latanya McKinney for their hard work on this. Thank you, Chair Drum. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you so much for your kind words. I have to tell you though, it wouldn't be possible unless I had a wonderful co-chair in Vanessa Gibson. And uh, she really knows her stuff. She's taken on the aspect of the capital budget, uh, a difficult job, something hard to understand. And she's done it enthusiastically, professionally, and uh, with compassion for everyone. And she represents her district up in the Bronx very, very well. And I now want to give her the opportunity to say a few words. Before Thank you turn it over to her, before you, uh, Vanessa is the best. And she and I did <laughs> an amazing town. I didn't even know she was on here. Uh, she here. and I did an amazing town hall together the other night. And uh, I am so proud of her. I'm proud of the work. You see her outside right now, because literally <laughs> from morning until night, she is working in her district, feeding families, going to public housing developments, responding to constituents. She and I did a two hour town hall uh, in her district the other night, and she is uh, just one of the, the best members of the city council. So I love you, Vanessa, and I'm grateful to your leadership and being a great team of Danny throughout this entire process as well. Thank you for everything, and I, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Speaker Corey Johnson. Thank you to our amazing Chair Danny Drum, who has worked so hard during this budget process, holding all of these virtual hearings, the first ever for the city council. We are so grateful for you, Danny, to you and your staff. I know it's not been easy. I've joined you as much as I could to make sure that we are responsible and we are responsive to all New Yorkers during this process. And certainly I wanna thank the speaker for his leadership. We've talked so much during this pandemic about how we can do more as a council, not just during the budget, but certainly in our communities. And I'm so grateful for your friendship, for your leadership and everything that you have done on behalf of not just my borough of the Bronx, but on behalf of the city of New York and Latanya McKinney and all of our unit heads and deputy directors in the finance division, all of our analysts, thank you, thank you, thank you for helping the members of the council with all of our hearings, all of the data, the information. We appreciate all of your work. And I know today is going to be a long afternoon. Over 300 New Yorkers have signed up to testify, but that just speaks volumes to the importance of the work we're doing. This budget, this executive budget, 
for FY21 is going to have a real impact on all New Yorkers from all walks of life, all zip codes across the city of New York. So it's important for all of us as the speaker and our chair continuously talks about the urgent need for federal support and federal dollars. We cannot do this by ourselves as a city. We need federal support. We need to make sure that we're working with our partners in Congress and in the U.S. Senate and certainly all of you. I wanna thank all New Yorkers, first responders, essential workers, everyone on the ground for what you've done, our not-for-profits, our unions, our teachers, educators, everyone, thank you so much for what you have done on behalf of your members, your constituents, your clients, your family, your neighbors. We are all in this together as New Yorkers and only together will we survive this pandemic and obviously learn a lot and rebound and heal as a community. Uh, we are grateful for all of you. And certainly we have to express condolences to all of those who have been deeply affected by COVID-19, those who may have lost a loved one, a family member, a friend. We mourn with you and those that are on the road to recovery. Thousands of New Yorkers have survived COVID and are here to tell their story. And we appreciate that. So I look forward to today's hearing Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Chair Drum. And thank you to all of my colleagues, those of you that chaired hearings as well these past couple of weeks. Thank you to the Finance Division. And let's have our hearing. And thank you all for everything you're doing. God bless you all. Thank you. And I want to echo your sentiments in regard to Latanya McKinney, uh, Regina Pareda Ryan. Yay, finance team. They have been so <laughs> wonderful, yes. so professional. Uh, I love them, and I would not be where I'm at where, without them. Thank you so much, um, uh, Latanya and Regina. Of course, to our counsel, to Rebecca Chasen, to Noah Brick, to Stephanie Ruiz. Thank you for your professionalism. Thank you for your guidance. They've been with me every step of the way on all of these virtual uh, hearings as well. So thank you very much. And uh, we can finally say that we're now going to begin the uh, public portion of this hearing, um, and uh, we will start uh, with the first um, person from the public who wants to give testimony. Council, can you please call up the first panel? Yes, thank you, Chair Drum. Uh, panelists, as a reminder, you will be on mute until it is time for you to testify, at which time your name will be called and you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. And let me just also thank Nathan Toth for his work as well, because I left him out by mistake. Nathan, you're super spectacular. I thank you. And I hope Robin has not uh, been uh, too uh, much of a pest, but a good pest to you. <laughs> but thank you, Nathan, as well. Uh, panelists, if you mute yourself after you have been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. You have been renamed with your panel number to give you a sense of when you may be called. And please do not uh, use the raise the virtual raise hand function in Zoom. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to tell you when your time begins and the Sergeant will let you know when your time is up. As a reminder, you have two minutes for your testimony. After your panel has finished testifying, you will be removed from the Zoom meeting by the host and you may continue watching the hearing at www.council.nyc.gov slash livestream. We will now hear from the first panel, which will be Michael Mulgrew, Shante Brown, John Castaldo, and Mark Canizaro. The time starts now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Michael Mulgrew, and I want to uh, introduce uh, Ms. Shant uh, Shante Brown from PS80 in Queens. Uh, John Castaldon from the High School for Public Service, who are joining us. And uh, Mark, if it's all right with you, I'd like to allow them to start. Absolutely. It's nice to see you, Mark and uh, Michael, it's Corey. Thank you guys for being here, both of you. You're, you're, Thank you uh, for having us. And I wanna, Thank I, wanna, you. I wanna just say, I'm so sorry about all the losses that you all have suffered of your members and the hard work that the teachers and principals and assistant principals sure. have continued to do under the most trying circumstances. Thank the you. number of families that your members have served is heroic and inspiring. So make sure we put time back on the clock because I just took some of their time. But I want to <coughs> thank Michael and Mark and all of their members. And I want to thank them for being here today. 
Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Corey. And reset it time. Time starts now. Um, my name is Shante Brown. Um, I am actually a second grade teacher at Public School 80. Thank you. Um, I just want to walk you through my day, my weekdays. My weekday started at 815, where I virtually meet with my fellow colleagues and administration. By 845, I'm gathered with my class together via the Google Meet. The four walls may have changed, but learning happens every day. I plan and prepare daily Google slides and colorful anchor charts and support my students in the Google Classroom platform. Making sure that social interaction is present, that human connection that shows the passion for learning and ability to identify the difference between a mistake and an error. Comforting words of you got this. When the Google Me ends, the students return to their Google Classroom to continue their work. I'm so impressed that my second graders are able to revise, edit, and resubmit a Google document, something I did not imagine that I could have ever taught them. Throughout the day, I'm answering questions of theirs, their parents, and I also try my best to stay up to date. Also, troubleshooting with parents, content. I have a dad that messages me all the time, Ms. Brown, I'm not a teacher, as he tries his best to reinforce my math. Um, also, I have parents that are frontline workers, essential workers that message me at 2.30 in the morning when they get home. It's all appropriate because we're all working to help the students. Parents are juggling a lot. Some have been sick themselves. They're trying to help their children. One of our students even lost a parent due to COVID-19. Mostly the parents just need to know that we're there together. We're in this together. Still learning despite everything. When we are, or if we are back in our physical school, we do not need anything taken away. Our children will need more, not less. Please honor the work they have and we as educators have done to project our school budgets. Thank you. I tried to put my video on, but it wouldn't let me. Sorry. <laughs> hey, you're a hero and you should know that. And all of the teachers in New York City who have done what you've done are heroes. Thank you so much for your testimony. Now I'd like uh, to John. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is John Castaldo and I'm a social studies teacher at the High School for Public Service in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to share my experience of distant learning, distance learning during this pandemic. Uh, I'd love to be physically teaching my students in my classroom, but learning continues regardless. Of course, it looks different, but again, it continues. It's an all hands on deck approach. The vast majority of teachers in my school are teaching live classes in Google Meet anywhere from two to four days per week. I personally teach live every Tuesday and Friday because those are the days when I see all of my classes. Our teachers want to see their students. I can't stress this enough, but we need to be flexible because some of our students are unable to log in during class time. And often these are some of our most vulnerable students. As a result, our teachers have said that they would like to keep a mix of live instruction, recorded instruction, and small group instruction, as well as post content and materials that students can access when they are able. Indeed, my colleagues and I are responding to student emails well into the evening because that's when some students are able to log on. Our school has developed multiple ways to support students, including twice weekly advisory classes that are live. Every teacher has daily office hours. We have virtual town hall meetings with class grades. Uh, teacher outreach to students via phone, email, and remind app, paraprofessionals, school counselors, school social worker, and school aides are continuing to do outreach and helping with outreach, different meetings to identify at-risk students. Essentially, we utilize any adult who has a connection with the student to provide outreach and support. So what do we need for September? We need all hands on deck. We need our full staff. We also need protocols to ensure that every person in the school building is safe and stays healthy and flexibility and programming for those teachers who have children or elderly parents or who are immunocompromised. It also would be beneficial for teachers to have professional development around areas of technology and individuals within school buildings who are trained to solve tech related issues. We need all hands on deck. Thank Time's you. expired. You may continue. You may continue. John, were you done? Oh, I'm done. Yes, thank you. Oh, Sorry. Okay. Boy, you got it right down on the two minute uh, mark there. Thank Sorry. you very much. And uh, as I said before, you're a hero to change over from classroom teaching to remote learning. I, I was a teacher for 25 years. I don't know if I could have done it 
Um, as a matter of fact, I don't even know how to create a Google, a Google Doc. So uh, you all are heroes. Uh, Mr. Mulgrew. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chair, uh, Drum, Chair Drum, I just wanna, I wanna thank uh, Ms. Brown and Mr. Costaldo for their willingness to take time today to be here even outside of the classroom to mm -hmm. advocate for the teachers and children of New York City. This is them again, going above and beyond to talk about the needs of the families that they serve, the children that they serve, their colleagues, their school communities. I mean, I have the chills honestly saying it right now because in the last uh, three weeks, I have done a Zoom conference with every PTA in my district uh, of every elementary school. And what I have heard over and over again from now thousands of parents is just how grateful they are for the teachers and the principals and parent coordinators and assistant principals for continuing to work so hard. So I really, really wanna thank you both so much for what you're doing for the children of our city and representing so many other teachers today who can't be here. Okay, I'm sorry, I turn it back over to, to uh, President Mulgrew. And time starts now. Well, thank you everyone and thank you, um, thank you, Corey. Uh, thank you to the chairs, uh, Danny, to Vanessa, uh, to Mark. Uh, thank you for all that you've done. Look, you just heard from two phenomenal teachers, but this is a story being told across our city. Uh, the heroic work, uh, a workforce that was not trained to do any of this work, but we figured it out. There was no federal support. There was no state support. There was no city support. We figured it out. We made it happen on behalf of the children because that's what we know what was needed. And we are we do this by working with everybody in the school community, the principals, the teachers, the parents have all worked together to make these things happen. But now we're facing an unprecedented challenge. And that's a word we keep saying every other week, we have another unprecedented challenge. And this budget clearly is one. I am here to tell you that we are happy that the U UFT, the teachers of New York City were the first ones over a month ago to start a petition with parents and teachers talking about what we need to have a safe school opening and the funding that we're, that's going to be required. And now we are launching across the entire United States that same coalition with parents, teachers, advocates, all working together, red states and blue states to say, we need this federal package. Without this federal package, we know that the children will be greatly harmed. They've already been harmed this year. The social emotional damage is huge. Uh, we have so much more to do. So I am, I am very confident we will get that done, but I am asking you here, besides the testimony that I'm submitting that all of the things that we've been do done in the past, and I've always stressed this to all of you, it's always that whatever you give us and support us goes directly to the school. Well, we need to make sure whatever money is coming from the federal government comes through the state and through the city and actually goes through the school, gets to the school and the children. We cannot afford to have every level of government taking money off the top for whatever they think is best and not get I'm to the sorry. children. And I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President Mulgrew. Um, I just need to... Um, get an opinion from you on the cuts that we see coming to the Department of Education. Can you give us an idea of what cuts to the Department of Education, what type of an effect that will have on our teachers and on our students in New York City? At the same time the mayor is saying we need an unprecedented school year, the majority of the cuts go directly at programs and services that actually help children. And you know, we've had this frustration for years uh, we know that not including busing or food, that the Department of Ed is spending $6 billion on central, um, on their central offices, and we think that's absurd, uh, and, and it's getting even more absurd every year that we go along, uh, but the cuts that they have announced at this point in time are directly aimed at the schools and services that are directly for children. So from mental health services to specific programs, to you know, children, uh, the summer works program, all of this stuff is directly being aimed at the school communities. They might have done this for political reasons, but whatever it is, it says uh, you can't say at one moment that we're doing you know we need an unprecedented school year next year, and then at the same time announce cuts of that nature. And 
we all know that uh, we, there's, when it comes to cuts, uh, a fight we've been having for quite some time, Danny, as you know, is uh, that behemoth known as DOE Central uh, never seems to uh, look at itself. Okay, thank you, President Mulgrew. Of course, I could talk to you for hours about uh, education issues, but we have 366 people. I heard. Bye. You got a big lesson planned today, my friend. <laughs> yeah, Danny, I, I apologize. I'll be very quick. I just want to uh, be a little specific, and it's so helpful to have Michael and Mark here and, and the teachers and members here. So, Michael, the, the proposed cuts that we saw in the executive budget a significant cut to fair student funding, yep. uh, which will impact so many schools. And Staff, personnel, yep. Exactly. Uh, and uh, Chair Drum and Chair Traeger have been working, you know, literally every single day trying to identify other cuts, ones that you mentioned, of things that you could cut in DOE that do not affect the classroom, that do not affect children, that do not affect teachers and instruction and the ability for kids to get what they need during this really difficult time. Um, I, I just would love it if, uh, of course, we could continue to work together as we always do on having you all help us identify things at DOE Central with the outside consulting contracts. Uh, uh, other things that we can actually propose to cut um, that are not gonna affect the classroom. So any suggestions that you all have, we look forward to continue to hear those throughout this process. Uh, well, I appreciate that offer. And it's just, um, when we had to switch to remote learning, the schools looked to it, towards each other. Thank God you supported Teacher Center last year because without Teacher Centers uh, being able to do so much of this work and connecting schools with uh, schools that were doing, uh, had some technology backgrounds with schools that didn't and making all that work, nobody looked at the Department of Ed. Mm -hmm. And that's what tells you the most. Nobody looked to the Department of Ed. All the schools looked to each other. And that's how it got done. Thank so you, I think that they need to really do some serious reflecting, to use a very, uh, an educational term, reflecting about what they're doing. Thank you, Michael. And again, we're thinking about all of the uh, teachers and principals and assistant principals that we've lost. And I would like to just take a moment and have a moment of silence for them, uh, for you. everyone who works at the Department of Education that we've lost over the last two and a half months. Thank you, Michael. I hope your mother stays safe. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay, we'd like to go now to our next panel, please. Uh, we'll, we'll first hear from Mr. Canizaro. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. And uh, I, Danny, I understand you want to get this moving along. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Mark. Don't worry. <laughs> no, I understand. Good afternoon. And, and you know, it, it was really refreshing to hear from Michael. And, and I'll be able to make my comments short because the CSA is going to echo um, many of those comments. But to uh, Chairman Danny Drum and, and uh, Corey, thank you so much for those kind words and, and thank you for being here also. And, and to Vanessa and of course, Mark Traeger, uh, we support, we appreciate all your support and the time you're taking to do this. And I certainly hope that everyone um, I just mentioned as well as all on this call are, are safe and their families are safe at this uh, incredibly uncertain time. Um, the CSA certainly recognizes the, the tremendous um, economic crisis that this city and this nation is in. And, and we also are working um, throughout the state and the nation uh, with our national organization and our state organization to try to push for the stimulus dollars that we need in order to keep this city and not just the Department of Education, but the entire city afloat. But um, what Michael said is so critical that, that we're pretty confident that these dollars will be coming, but we just need to make sure that they get through all of the channels and get directly to the classrooms. You know, and in, in for the last several years, we have been pushing hard on this fair student funding piece um, because that is the aid that goes directly to the classrooms. And we are currently, by the city's own math, $700 million in deficit towards fair student funding. Yet each year prior to this year, education funding has increased 
and programs have been put in place, but a large percentage of schools were still directly underfunded for their basic needs. But now we here we come into this um, this this real economic crisis that everyone understands is a real crisis, and we're I'm talking sorry. about additional cuts and additional cuts to fair student funding, the aid that goes directly to school. We simply can't sustain it. And and to um, Speaker Johnson's point, we're happy to work with you to identify other areas where we think um, dollars could be saved. But let's understand that less than one third of the city's budget actually goes directly to schools. So wherever we find the, the cuts that are necessary, if in fact they do become as necessary as we, we fear, we need to look at the other two thirds and, and, and find the cuts um, that are needed. Uh, we also have a, a tremendous professional development program that has been critical, critical, critical at this time. We've gone completely to remote PD and our attendance is greater than ever, which is telling us that there is a real need out there. And, and in addition to that, we're expecting before this crisis, we're expecting a tremendous turnover in school leaders in the next 18 months. Due to this crisis, we're expecting it to even be a little greater than, than we were than we thought. So we need to develop the next um, next group of school of school leaders, and we're doing a terrific job thus far. But we need to expand that. So with all of the things that are coming down, we need to we need to keep the money focused where it does the most good for children, and that's in the schools, developing teachers, developing school leaders, and and helping children to. Uh, come through this not only academically but socially and emotionally as well. So thank you all for all you're doing and, and, and thank you. And I do have to also speak to our partnership with the UFT during this crisis has been one of the major reasons that we're doing as well as we can. So thank you, Michael, and to the UFT and thank you to all of you. Thank you, Mark. I want to again thank you and just give you a, a, a a flavor of, you, you may know this already, what so many of your members in my district are doing. I've been doing Zoom calls every week that are led by uh, the principals. I did one two days ago with Kelly Shannon, the principal of PS40 in Greenwich Village. I did one the week before at PS33 with Cindy Wang, uh, one of your principals. Uh, I did one uh, last week with Bob Bender, the principal, uh, uh, you know, in Chelsea. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so they have continued to keep their school communities together. And the parents were sort of just thanking the principals so much for their consistent communication. A lot of the parents were not happy with DOE, really angry with the communication that's come out of DOE, but thanking the principals and assistant principals and teachers for their work. So I want to thank you, Mark, and again, give you our condolences for the members that you've lost. Yes, thank you. And, and thank you for that moment of silence. I, I think that was important and we appreciate that. Yeah, and I just want to uh, echo those sentiments and say thank you as well. Principals really set the tone in schools and what I have seen happen here in my district is that the principals have really stepped up to the plate. They've uh, remained motivational. They have provided excellent leadership. They have transitioned to uh, the remote learning. Uh, they're on Twitter, they're making announcements, they're holding PTA meetings. It's just amazing to see uh, what all of our, our schools are doing. And I, and I thank you very, very much, especially having been a former CSA member. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we will now hear from the next panel, which will be Donald Nesbitt, Ralph Palladino, Marlene Giha, and Ron Barber. I'm starts now. Mr. Nesbitt. Uh, good afternoon. And thank you, uh, Councilman Drum and Councilwoman Gibson. Um, and thank you to, Cor to Speaker Corey Johnson and the members of the City Council. So I start out by saying um, school crossing guards who make $20,000 a year are, first, are quite often the first line of defense to improve safety. They take care of students, they take care of adults, and they take care of everyone. Safety is paramount, and that is evident in the job that, and the work that they're doing at this time. School crossing guards are not often paid for snow days and whenever schools are closed, often losing compensation when everyone else in the school community is compensated. Local 372 acts uh, respectfully that this changes and we request at this time for school crossing guards that has it pays a must. 
School lunch employees on a normal day, children eat food in order to concentrate and learn in the classroom, which, they, which school lunch employees regularly serve 900,000 meals a day. School lunch employees work hard every day, both in good and bad times. And now as essential workers, they are serving 500,000 meals a day, even during this pandemic, amounting to close to 15 million meals served to families during this time. These demands are not easy. They follow strict standards. They are often spread thin with breakfast in the classroom and preparing for, for lunch. We as Local 372 are in full agreement with all of these programs and feeding children and families but we request that when new programs are implemented, they consider staffing. Quite often staffing levels are not considered when they're in the thinking stages. Also, adequate AC and cooling systems need to be installed now for these lunchroom workers. And lastly, hazard pay is a must for them. Our non-essential staff, the parent coordinators, the community titles, school aides, family workers, staffers. Oh, expired. All. You may continue. All of, these, all of these titles at this time, whereas they are named non-essential, are performing essential services. Our parent coordinators, our school age family workers are calling families and taking the, the blunts of what communities are feeling at this time. They are assisting teachers in their tremendous work and what they're doing, but how do you ask children to log into remote learning when, when we make a phone call, we find out that families have lost and children have lost a brother, a sister, mother, or father? These local 372 members are taking these stories while continuing to take care of their own families and make sure that their own children, grandchildren, are receiving educa their educational needs. Parent coordinators need job security now. Our staffers are still conducting presentations to prevent children from using drugs and controlled substances during this COVID-19 pandemic, yet they face dangerous le levels as there are only 270 staffers citywide, serving 1.1 million children that is about one per every 5,000 children. We ask that these numbers increase, especially post COVID-19 where they will be needed even more and more. We have members who are homeless. Okay. Uh, we, are, we have members who are homeless during this time. Uh, we have those who have lost uh, pay at the DOE. And um, we ask that that change. Um, School support staff are critical to a functioning school system. They create space every day where teachers can teach and students can learn. Local 372 workers will provide these services as essential or non-essential to the public school system. We, we thank the city council, Speaker Corey Johnson, and the individual members, um, Councilman Drum, Vanessa Gibson, Councilwoman. Uh, we recognize that they are tough decisions as far as resources at this time, but we thank you for always taking on worthy issues um, and service in our members that allocate and allocate um, adequate funds for our members. We ask that this continues, even though hard decisions have to be made uh, for these workers, whether essential or non-essential. And behalf of the 24,000 members of Local 372 and under the leadership of Sean D. Francois the first, uh, we thank you for the opportunity to have testimony before you. Thank you, Mr. Nesbitt. And um, I have to say, you know, your workers, the members of your union have been exemplary. I uh, went out and looked at the uh, grab and go lunches. They got a whole system going. They're there every single day. They're really on the ground and they're really frontline workers. Um, as are the other members of your union, the school crossing guards, they're out there. They're actually helping form the lines in front of the schools. You know, They're going above and beyond uh, their duties. So I am uh, most grateful. I have seen what's happening and uh, please convey our gratitude to your members as well. Yeah, thank you so much for that council. Thank you. Mr. Palladino. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, you'll be receiving our lengthier local 1549 written testimony later today. Um, so I'll just get right to it. So you wanna cut fat from the city budget. Well, we've said it before. First, civilianize the NYPD. Why are 500 uniform officers still sitting in desks doing the work that police administrative aides wasting $30 million a year do? Meanwhile, crime has been spiking and the NYPD wants to continue to downsize the PAA title. Two, staffing, 911 staffing, first responders. 
911 is fully staffed. Not really. 400 additional police officers have been added to perform 911 duty during this crisis due to short staffing. And that is without the texting that starts in June. Three, uphold civil service. The city, DCAS, and especially ACS and HRA are subverting civil service and wasting millions of dollars by replacing civil service clerical titles with higher paid non-competitive and managerial titles doing the same work. Three, or four, I'm sorry. Eligibility specialists, HRA, and the city attributed 400 positions of eligibility specialists who determine eligibility for HASA, SNAP, and Medicaid. We opposed this last year. Now, in the SNAP program, the ESs are working from 7 in the morning to 8.30 at night, and the city has to move higher paid caseworkers, 200 of them, and Metro Plus HMO workers to meet that demand. As far as furloughs and layoffs being on the table, and hopefully they will be off the table, those jobs and services will be lost and felt most by the communities of color in this city. I'm fired. Thank you. Thank you, and Mr. Palladino, we will follow up with you. Thank you very much. Marlene Giha. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Marlene Aguida, and I am part of DC 37 Local 983. I'm a PEP officer uh, for 20 years, and I'm also a union rep. I represent the city seasonal aides, the PEP offices, rangers, APSW maintenance workers. Um, I want to say that we're currently pleading with you to continue to employ the par Parks Department employees who are designated for the parks. They already know the patrons in the parks and are also part of this great city and community. Our CSAs are one of the lowest paid workers in the city, but are also the backbone of keeping everyone able to enjoy the parks department uh, and the beaches and the pools. Um, we would like to see them working. We wanna keep all our parks department employees employed our PEP offices and ranges are necessary to keep everyone safe in the in the park and the city depends on them as well as the needs of the maintenance workers now more than ever. There are currently 44 play fair ranges at risk of losing their jobs and 80 PEP offices at risk um, at losing their jobs July 1st. So we're asking that these lines be baselined. Um, we understand that the city wants to add ambassadors uh, to the parks department um, and have them patrolling the parks. And it sounds like a good idea, but we're seeing problems already within the parks. We have some of the ambassadors giving incorrect information. And also we had an incident where a member of the public needed an ambulance and the ambassadors didn't actually know where they were. So we're asking that you keep the parks department employees, the ones who've been doing the job all along to keep them working. Um, and I wanna thank all I'm the parks excited. department employees. Um, we also ask that the parks department employees be given um, the hero money and please keep our parks department employees working. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go to our next um, testimony. Oh, it starts now. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Daniel Drum, uh, Speaker Corey Johnson, and fellow committee members. I first want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to testify on behalf of all the union members of the Brooklyn Public, New York Public, and Queens Public Library. We are united in our request uh, that the City Council save our libraries. Uh, let me begin by saying thank you for last year's budget. Um, the city council and the mayor provided the city's library system with an exceptional budget. These funds allow the library system to continue all excellent library services uh, to your constituents uh, and that they expected from us. Uh, and to begin to meet the system expanded needs. Um, so fast forwarding, I want to say that 
um, we were hit with uh, a virus that created anxiety and confusion in our people. A few people in this city understood what would befall us and no one could fully appreciate the impact this virus will have. Now, following the major, the mayor's lead and the immense relief for our library staff, the library system's physical location shut down. Now, we are able to, uh, we were able to cut our bread and be able to assess the physical and mental health of our staff. We also began strategizing on how to provide library services virtually. Immediately after that, we began moving our programs online, expanding our digital material and increasing Wi-Fi accessibility. Now, in our ninth week of the shutdown, library staff have gotten into a groove of keeping our libraries operating and meeting our online demands. The four unions are working with the three library system to ensure our patrons get as many I'm services- tired. As we, as we can safely provide, maintaining our physical sense of community with our patrons. As the city reopens up, the libraries will be there to and ready to help the city and our fellow New Yorkers on the road to recovery. We will be a stabilizing force in every neighborhood. We know that we are challenging times, but it's our hope that the financial support we need from the city council and the mayor so that we can be effective partners in the city recovery. We want to dedicate this testimony to the members of local 374, 1321, 1482, and 1930, who have lost family members, friends, loved ones, uh, and that they made the ultimate sacrifice to this disease. Submitted by yours truly, Ronaldo Barber, president local 1482, Val Colon, President, New York Public, Local 1930, John Heislop, Queens Public Library, Local 1321, and Leonard Paul, President, uh, Local 374, Quasi Public Employee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Barber. I know that Council Member Van Bramer has a question. Sure. Am I muted? You're good. So first of all, thank you very much. I'm uh, calling from a car because we're distributing masks uh, to our district. Um, but I wanna just say uh, thank you to uh, Ron uh, representing all library uh, employees and uh, all of the hardworking men and women of DC 37. Uh, and even though our libraries are physically not open right now, uh, I know that they're still providing incredible services. And uh, when we are ready to reopen uh, our city, uh, there is no reopening without our public libraries being fully funded and all of our staff being able to go back to work. So uh, I know that uh, the speaker and the chair uh, have been big supporters of our public libraries. And I know the council has always fought for them, so I just wanted to uh, weigh in again and say thank you so much to all the hardworking library employees, DC 37 members, and just know uh, that myself and others, uh, we're gonna go to battle on behalf of our public libraries, and in particular, the hardworking men and women of DC 37. So thank you, and thank you, Chair Drum, for allowing me the opportunity to say a few words. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank, yeah, thank, th thank you, Chair Drum, and thank you, Councilmember Van Bramer. If we can, uh, Chair Drum, if we could have a moment of silence for all of the DC 37 workers that we've lost, which is well over 100. I was speaking to Henry Garrido the other day. If we could take a moment of silence to think of all these wonderful workers who are such an important part of our city that we've lost. <laughs> Thank you. And I want to thank Ron Barber, of course, for testifying. I want to thank Ralph for testifying. I want to thank, of course, the folks who are representing our parks workers. And I want to just uh, give a shout out to Councilmember Van Bramer, who has been chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs for the last 11 years. And in every conversation,